We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, we're recording on a Tuesday once again, and uh, yeah, lots and lots of questions. We'll try to get to it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're recording on a Tuesday because my son's birthday was on uh, uh, St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day, Day so, yeah. and he was sick the, the yeah. like four days before that, so he decided to schedule something later, and for reasons I cannot possibly fathom, my wife agreed to doing it Monday night on okay. spring break. Ah, right, right, right. So it's spring break, which is fine, but I had work, and I had other things I needed to do, and I really didn't need to be doing this, and I spent all day with those kids, and uh, there wasn't that many. <laughs> But I, yeah, last night they had a sleepover. So as I mentioned last night, we bought a, uh, an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, the right. X700. Yep, and Sony we bought, X700. Uh, we bought the Thor Ragnarok. And right. the boys watched it in here last night. I left them alone. I'm like, okay. I'm not going in there. You guys do your thing. You guys do what you would do. And then you can, you know, whatever. And I actually told my wife a couple of times, like, I'm hearing too much stuff coming from the home theater because we were mm. not that far away. I'm like, we need to move further away because I'm getting spoilers and I don't want to get spoiled. <laughs> so I had to go further away. So last night after they went to bed, I watched it. Okay. Uh, so the the Sony X700, whatever it's called, UDP or whatever it is, X700, uh, I, hooked it the, I hooked the Netflix up and the Netflix has got an audio delay that's pretty significant. And oh, I okay. can't figure out a way to fix it because huh. the audio delay does not exist on the Blu-rays, so I don't want to change the delay on the receiver sure, end, right, right, right. because that'll mess everything up. Yeah. So I'm still kind of futzing with that. Now, I'll be honest with you, there's a part of me that thinks I've done something wrong as far as the audio settings, because the the bass in Thor Ragnarok, I mean, the whole movie itself, like usually I listen, I've said this before, if I'm trying to impress people, I might bump it up to reference level or a couple of dB past reference level. This one just to listen to it like at what I thought was a reasonable level with people asleep not uh -huh. that far away, I was at plus five. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. So, and I never thought the bass was all that. I mean, I could feel it vibrate in the couch a little bit, but yeah. then I got, I got two big subs in a very in a smallish room, so I would expect that to happen. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, it's saying Dolby Atmos on the receiver, and I've checked the audio settings. Everything, it's it's set to let your receiver decode or whatever it's called. Yep, yep, yep. So, it, it should be right, but... Are you I only a using a impressed. single HDMI connection going from the player to your receiver and then receiver yeah. to the projector, or...? Yeah. Yeah. Because it does have the dual HDMI outputs with the audio-only second HDMI. You could maybe give that a try. I don't no, know why it would help. But could... Why would that make any difference? I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't imagine why it would. I'm going to fuss with the settings and see what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. And I'm, I also need to... Uh, look, I, I mean, I've only got two Ultra HD Blu-rays, and one right. of them's Logan. And when I started Logan the other day, I didn't notice that. So mm. maybe maybe Thor is just mixed yeah. quieter. Who knows, somehow? yeah. I don't know. Anyhow, loved it. Good. Watched it last night, loved it. I, I mean, after all the hype for Black Panther, and I liked Black Panther... I loved Thor Ragnarok. Oh, okay. I thought that was quite a bit better in my book. But yeah, the the performances maybe like Kate Blanchett who yes. you know was chewing up the scenery and stuff oh, like yes. that. Didn't love her as much as I love Killmonger from uh yeah. Uh Black Panther. Uh, Black Panther, but loved it. Loved loved the rest of the movie quite a bit. The All right. Banner stuff. All right, let's get on this. This is AV Rent, the <laughs> podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. Uh, YouTube.com slash C slash avrant. <gasps> you don't have to say the C anymore. That's coming what? up in our listeners of the week. It's just YouTube.com no slash avrant. It works now. Uh, I don't believe it. I know. You're going to check right now. Aren't I'm you? checking right now. <laughs> AV rant. YouTube.com slash AV rant. <gasps> it goes to our page. It goes to our page. It's, it's like literally my face boy. on there right now. We're like, well, I'm a real boy. Anyway, <laughs> uh, YouTube.com slash AV rant. I know. 
where you can leave a comment that we will ignore. So mm. do not leave a comment. I mean, you can leave a com YouTube loves it if you leave comments. Leave all the comments there. I don't care. It's just that it's very hard for us to read them because they, they, we don't get real uh, good announcements about them. Uh, I guess I don't. I it's also ever... like the only place we get negative comments. <laughs> so, I mean, but I guess they come from months, humble, months ago. <laughs> months ago, it's like, hey, this this information is completely out of date. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's a year old video. Welcome to yeah, it's like Real World. episode five twelve. Why did you say this? That's not true. They're watching it now. It's like, yeah, yeah. Look at the date on the video. <laughs> Anywho, uh, if you want to contact us directly, it's Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. It's Tom at avrant.com. Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. We also have our producer, Austin. It's because uh, uh, Twitter is at Austin Pond, T E N Pond. Austin has uh, got his own podcast, so we watch movies podcasts, a podcast about names of people, famous or not, who have numbers within their names. So. Mm. Uh, this all came about because Austin, okay, ten has ten gotcha. in it, yeah, and then then they talk about that. I'm struggling to think of any other names, but all right, we won't they spend exist. Too much on that. They exist. It's I'm not. Sure I mean, I mean, their podcasts are three minutes long, and they've got you know 14 of them. So I mean, it doesn't take long to go through the whole backlog. It's just a couple of people, most of them named Austin. To be honest with you, it's a bunch <laughs> of Austins. <laughs> Ten, Lord Tennyson, Tennyson, Tennyson's on there. Okay, sure. yeah, he's going to be on there. Earl of so, eight, eight, which eight, eight, I think that's the Earl. For for folks who are asking, both of us sound better. We both seem to be uh, on the mend. And, uh, yeah, uh, we'll see what happens. I was a hot mess that uh, night. I just got progressively sicker as I. I wasn't sick. I was just like really bad allergies that just kept getting worse and worse. Uh, it rained. So that has helped. Ah, knock down the pollen. There you go. Knock down the pollen quite a bit. Um, I'm still like right now. I've got like some sort of hive action going on on my arms. So I need to. I need to take some uh, some sort of Benadryl tonight. But we will see. Okay. All right. Listeners of the week. Let's get into the li listeners of the week. Yeah. So to uh, start with, we like to thank our listeners of the week. There's people that support the podcast in some way. One way they can do that is by going to www.avrent.com, cl clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which pay takes them to a PayPal donation. Those monies go into our coffers, which help pay for hosting fees and other such things. Like my wife just told me that uh, AV Rent owes uh, her a bunch of money. <laughs> I'm like, what? Still? She's like, yeah. Really? Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's backlog stuff. So I mean, she's, huh. it's been keeping it's been it's been in there that she has not transferred over. She's like, do you have this much money in there? Because you know, you guys, that's kind of like in you know whatever <laughs> you got. Like we're in the black in that we're no longer we're like self sufficient as far as hosting fees and everything. Right. But apparently, like we haven't paid the person who does the taxes or which is this other lady for my business because ah. you know, maybe rents under a business in like four years <laughs> like okay. she, she has she hasn't sent us a bill in four years so it's not our fault but she's like we're about to get a big bill so i'm just letting you know anyhow so that's good so we want to thank uh brock and brandon uh they went to they gave us uh, some money through that and we want to thank them very much i guess brandon also noticed that the occasional white lines on this vizio p series tv went away after a firmware update so we might not return it uh, uh, at all i guess in favor of the lg oled which is something we talked about last week so we want to thank brock and brandon for their uh, donations yeah brock brandon thank you very much for those donations so and uh we want to thank our patrons over at uh patrons over at patreon patreon.com slash av ramp podcast is our site where you can sign up for their service which will give allow you to donate on a monthly basis it's kind of like a subscription thing so i want to thank our 56 patrons over there including john uh john who has uh let us know that he is one of our patrons if you're one of our patrons and would like us to mention you feel free to email us and we will for sure, yeah. Thanks so much to our 56 patrons. The number went up. Very happy about that. That's patreon.com slash Podcast. John S., thank you very much for being one of the patrons. And we, if you can't support the podcast financially, if you can figure out some other way to support it, to make our lives easier, or to let people know about us, just tell us what you did, and we'll mention you. So, Shubu2, 
which is somebody's username on YouTube, alerted us about the whole, we don't need to see anymore on YouTube. Yeah. So thank you, Shubu2. Yes, I very much appreciate it. I I never would have even thought to check if that were the case. So thank you for alerting us. How many times us. do I go to our web? Or oh, never. <laughs> John bought an SVS SB12 NSD subwoofer from their outlet section over at SVS. SVS provided checkboxes to let them know where they had heard about SVS. They had an AV Ramp podcast checkbox. So he ticked that one, of course. So yeah. we got our own box, dude. That's how cool we are with SVS. So thank you, John. <laughs> thank you very much, John. And congrats on that purchase. Very nice subwoofer. And Terry bought a couple of 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays because they were actually cheaper than the regular Blu-ray ver versions. He doesn't have a 4K setup yet, so he sent the UHD discs to, to Rob for free. Well, that's nice of him. Where were these cheaper than Blu-ray versions? Because I'd like to have some of those. Too. I'm not quite sure. I'm sure it happens from time to time. You know how yeah, it goes. Sure, so yeah. whatever for whatever reason, they're clearing them out. So yeah, Terry, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, what were they? E.T., which, you know, never that's a bad... Nice. Movie yeah. to have in, in any format. Uh, and uh, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, which I am looking forward to watching because, of course, it's not the one that's Oscar got all the, the Oscar things. Yeah, right? a bunch yeah. of Oscar buzz. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, yeah. Terry. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one of those movies I'm going to watch once. Maybe. Probably. I did notice that on uh, Netflix they have the, the Descent 2. Yes. I am a huge fan of, of the, the first, first Descent, Descent yeah. movie. Yes, I love that movie. I wouldn't I have get my hopes cut. up too high. I mean, I haven't seen Descent 2. Maybe it's great, but usually they're not. I have watched it. Oh. It is awful. Ah, okay. <laughs> it is so, <laughs> so bad. I mean, it is just the only good parts of this movie are the flashbacks to the original movie where they show scenes okay. from the original movie where you're like, remember how good the lighting was in the original movie? Remember how it didn't look like we were standing under the fluorescent <laughs> lights in a cave that was on a soundstage in Santa, you know, Santa Maria or Santa Paula, but whatever they call it, Santa Place in, in California. Remember that? So bad. Mm. So Can't incredibly bad. Can't say I'm shocked. No, I, I... Okay, this is how bad it was. I got... Three, two thirds of the way through the movie, I I pressed, I backed out of it. I was like, I cannot watch this garbage <laughs> anymore. And I'm like, no, nah, I just got, I'll just finish it. I hate not finishing movies, sure. so I I finished it. I am. It there was nothing redeeming it. about yeah. the movie. <laughs> there was nothing <laughs> redeeming at all. All right, in the news via Chris. There are some places around the web reporting that HDMI 2.1 devices are here right now. It's all because of some po computer monitors, some of the newly announced Samsung TVs, and the Xbox One X and Xbox One S offering support for VRR, which is a variable refresh rate. Which is one of the main features that are included in HDMI 2.1. There's also ALLM, which is this auto low latency mode, which is essentially just a flag that puts the TV into game mode automatically without the user having to manually switch picture modes. Naturally, this is all causing some confusion. <laughs> to be clear, none of these devices support 48 gigabits per second bandwidth. As the HDMI group themselves stated early in the year, existing 2.0 Oh, devices can potentially be upgraded to s support some of the features found in HDMI 2.1 spec, such as VRR and EARC, which mm -hmm. is what extended so enhanced like, audio return whatever. channel. Yeah, which gives us a lossless. Is that what I'm supposed to believe? From that's that? right. That's what it's supposed to. Which do. don't necessarily require increased bandwidth. But that isn't stopping some people from screaming, HDMI 2.1 is here! <laughs> yeah, the uh, the fervor over HDMI 2.1 across the web, it's... Uh, I mean, this is why HDMI never wanted specification numbers to be a public knowledge. That, that was never their intent. They wanted us to focus just on features, and the specification was supposed to be for the manufacturers behind the scenes to figure out what they needed to do. But of course, the numbers got out there, and that's what the public has glommed onto, because numbers that go up sequentially are easier to track and so as soon as like whatever the particular feature that they want of the new spec comes out they're like oh the new spec is here but it's not really like the real thing about hdmi 2.1 is the 48 gigabits per second and nothing yeah. has that yet yeah. so yeah. don't get too excited over that and it you know what it's a spec number like we shouldn't be really focusing no, on that but i i am i am i'm un I, I, I am very calm about the whole thing. Thank you, Rob, for calming me down. <laughs> also, via Chris, Vizio did something completely unexpected, unexpected with their latest beta firmware for the TVs. Apparently, they got their optical audio outputs to pass Dolby Digital Plus, which means you can get the lossy version of Atmos from some of the built-in streaming services using the optical collection, which is a first. So that's exciting. 
Yeah, that's uh, definitely unex unexpected, but HDMI ARC, the regular audio return channel that we all have right now, uh, that has the same amount of bandwidth as a SPDIF, a Sony Philips digital interface connection, which would be your digital coax or optical toss link connection. Those three things all have the same amount of bandwidth. So some companies, uh, Vizio and LG in particular, got Dolby Digital Plus working across HDMI ARC. So I guess Vizio was like, well, if we can do it there, why can't we do it across a SPDIF connection? It should work there too. And apparently they got it going. So that's the first time I've heard about Dolby Digital Plus being sent across an optical toss link connection, but uh, there you go. Good for them. It's still beta. Yeah. All right, I've got some comments here real quick. Michael in Austria or mm -hmm. Australia? No, Austria. Okay. Just wanted to say that Tom was probably thinking of the DAB Plus digital radio system in Europe when we were discussing why the Denon AVC X8500H has no FM radio uh, tuner built in. And he is correct. Okay. That is exactly what I was thinking of. However, Michael says that DAB Plus didn't replace FM radio. FM is still broadcast, so he finds the removal of FM tuners from AV receivers to be a slight annoyance. The DAB Plus system still requires a separate tuner box, and getting internet radio requires more button presses, so he'd still like an FM, FM tuner built in. And he's right. You know, if I had thought about it when I was saying that, and I wasn't so worried about snot running down my face, <laughs> I would have thought about the fact that I did have the DAB system, DAB Plus, or whatever uh -huh. it was, and I never used it. It was a part of my cable box. But we still listened to radio when we were driving uh -huh. around the car. So uh, clearly right, right. the FM was still there. I just wasn't making the connection in my big, sick brain. <laughs> uh, Henry on Twitter asked Rob for some tips on how to set up his dual subwoofers when they arrived. They prompt, that prompted Rob to type up a 12-step guide for setting up dual subs. That immediately prompted Mark to ask if Rob's guide would be applicable for three subs. It is not. We recommend using the multi-sub optimizer software for three or four subwoofer setups. Yeah. So did you post that on the website? I posted that on Twitter. So no, we'll have a link nope. for that in the thing. I get, If you want yeah. me to copy it over to the website, I can do that. Yeah. Make a, okay. make a, make a post on the website. I'll make so a little we'll post on the there. website then. There we go. And then you can send people to that. It will be a copy right. and a paste. That is fine. <laughs> you have 12 steps on Twitter? Yeah. Well, you know, if you can thread. And if you, oh. I start with, if you have an enclosed rectangular room, it's like a four-step process. Yeah. You only have to go up to the 12 steps if you do not have an enclosed rectangular room. But many people do not have an enclosed rectangular room. So There we go. All right, let's get to the questions here. Brock. Brock is wondering whether it's time to upgrade his 65-inch Panasonic TC series plasma to something newer to check out 4K and HDR content. Although his plasma... Pl tongue. Plama. Let's go here. Come on, the plama. Although his plasma still looks great, it emits a faint high-pitched whir sound, particularly in bright scenes, and that's slightly annoying. That's not uncommon with... Yeah, uh, that happens with plasmas. It's plasma just that panel yeah. buzz that comes out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It does. Also, with the 2018 LG OLEDs about to be released, he's seen a few deals on the 2017 models, like the 65-inch E7 for $23.99. He's concerned, though, are there any features in the 18 LG models or possibly the 19 models that he'll regret <laughs> not having if he buys a 2017? Probably. <laughs> well, but. so, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm quite happy that I got a 2017 is there were no major hardware changes. Like, you didn't get panels that are strikingly brighter uh, or anything like that. In fact, right, LG, is, right. LG is saying that the 2018s are using the exact same panels as the 2017s. So the major... So it's all software stuff. Yeah, it's all in the software. They they beefed and up the processor cosmetics. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they did... So, so the, the kind of main features that they talked about is black frame insertion, which is you're running the panel at 120 right. frames, but 60 out of those 120 are actual images and then the other 60 in between are black frames uh so vincent to from hdtv test he's got a look at the first ones going he's like you can see a bit of flicker when that thing is on and it dims the image so don't really know if that's going to be that popular turning it on uh mm -hmm. and then they have a new decontouring filter which is like if there is posterization like the uh, color banding um actually inherent in the source like a streaming source which is quite common right. uh this is supposed to filter that out they did the thing that lg always does which is they didn't bother making 
making a new menu item for that. They just hit it within the MPEG noise <laughs> menu. They're like, set MPEG noise to low, and it'll turn on the decontouring filter. Um, although now they have separated out the active HDR for HDR10 and given that its own menu item instead of hiding it behind the dynamic contrast setting like they did in 2017. So uh, each year after they add something, I guess they eventually give it. In 2019, I'm sure the decontouring filter will have its own menu item. That's how that's going to go. Um, wow. But yeah, the, I'm, uh, you know, I mean, on the if you were like a professional and you wanted the full 33 by 33 by 33 3D lookup table to get like super accurate colors, I guess you would want that. But for a consumer, they're already darn close out of the box. Right. So all the features that are in there, like it's kind of like the decontour feel, that'd be kind of nice. The black frame insertion, maybe you'd use it. Probably not if you can see the flicker happening. The right. 3D lookup table, consumers really probably aren't going to need that or get into that. So I I think getting a clearance priced 2017 model is like a darn good deal because you're getting the major thing, which was the panel that got much better between 2016 and 2017. The 2017 panels are like almost twice as bright as the 2016s. That's a mm. significant hardware thing. But I right. I feel pretty good about getting a 2017. And not just because I have one. I'm not saying that just because I have one. It's like... That, you know, the important thing is the hardware. The software stuff, less important. Okay. That's what I say. Just getting ready to change my AC, which is about to switch itself <laughs> off at 10 o'clock. Because I can feel it blowing. It's nice and cool in here. Yep. I'm not going to roast like I did last time. Uh, that's got, got me thinking about my, my Blu-ray player as well. Because I was noticing that it seemed... It seemed like there was something going on with the picture that was bothering me. Like there were, I don't know okay. if it, it, it almost seemed like the three, it, it was trying to do 3D without being 3D. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was, it, it, there may have been some edge enhancement. So I turn, turn the DRC completely off. That's probably yeah. right. It's usually right. But I, you know what? Maybe I'll, after the podcast, I'll go through with you on the, on the settings and we'll take a look and see what we see. Yeah. Uh, Brock's current theater room is an in law suite above his garage. It's funny. Okay. Let me go back. I just said, I'm going to go through with Rob. And everybody's like, well, doesn't Tom have like access to all the experts? Dude, email Rob. <laughs> we'll go through that. <laughs> I am Thanks. not special. <laughs> I'm not special around here. Rob will write you a 12 step guide, whether you like it or not. Uh, I mean, it, Email me too. I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, it's not like I'm an idiot, but I, I, I am. I double check. Why would I not double check if I've got access to a second pair of eyes? Yep. And most of the time, I'm doing this stuff. I'm doing it by myself, and everything's fine. And I can figure stuff up on my own, just like many of you can. But it's always good to have a second pair of eyes. All right. Brock's current theater room is the in-law suite above his garage. It's roughly 21 feet by 14 feet, with a long hallway at the back. But the ceiling is a very oddly shaped, with a, a large A-frame style slant at the front. A partial slant at the back, uh, but only on one side. Plus, there are skylights, a ceiling fan, and can lights going on all over the place in this thing. So, if you're watching our YouTube video, you will see that there is a uh, there's a drawing, which uh, kind of looks like a, um, a paddle of some sort. But basically, it's a long <laughs> yeah, there's hallway a hallway at the back there, yeah. at the back of this of this home theater. And his seat is about a little bit past, a uh, little bit further away from the TV than the middle of the room, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and where he's facing, we can see that there's a TV, and there's uh, on a separate picture a TV, a two two skylight like windows on the very slanted uh, mm -hmm. roof, two little tower speakers there. Uh, there's a couple of uh, recliners that are sitting, uh, probably well, there are definitely. T outside of the center the, the left and right speaker so yeah not prime seating there ceiling fan above there's some can lights there there's windows on the right and a door on the left the door probably goes to the attic one would think but i could be wrong about that so let's look around here we see the long hallway at the back though there's a door there there's a little bit of slant on one side which looks like it might be stairs that i'm guessing are going up someplace could be I don't know. It kind of looks that way. <laughs> and uh, there's a recess section right above him. That's it's it's all it's got a very strange ceiling. Yeah. So this is a new house for Brock and it has an unfinished basement. The basement is more or less divided into two sides by the staircase in the middle. OK, so the staircase in the middle of the room, we're seeing uh, on, like a drawing of it as well as well here. But you can see basically it is just an open space with a stairway down the middle. There's unfinished ceiling. There's uh unfinished walls that would kind of block off the bottom of the stairs there there's storage going on down there it looks like there might be a sink in one corner it's really hard to tell so <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on there 
One side is 28 feet long and 19 feet wide, but it has four support columns that run lengthwise, so it really disrupts the width of the space. And he does have those big support columns. And yep. yes. Uh, and that's, that, that's holding up your hose. So Yeah, you don't want to move those. Don't <laughs> kick those as you're walking by. The other side of the basement is about 19 feet long and 13 feet wide. 19 by 13. Okay. Uh, from the concrete floor to the joist above is 8 feet 9 inches, but there's some duct work that would lower the ceiling to about 8 feet. It's all unfinished. The foundation walls are completely open, uh, although they're totally covered with spray foam insulation. No matter what, Brock will be uh, using the in-law suite as his theater for at least the next year or two. But do we think either of the spaces in this basement would work for making a good theater? Basically, should he pour all of his effort into the in-law suite as his permanent theater? Or should he plan on his basement eventually being his dedicated theater, meaning that he, uh, he should only go for small and inexpensive improvements in his in-law suite for now? Uh, do I need to keep reading all this stuff? Cause this uh, no, these are things that were going to be consideration as we answer. Um Okay. But yeah, so I mean, I what it basically comes down to is if you look at the two halves of his basement, could he use one side or the other as his dedicated theater? Of course, he would finish it and and uh, yeah, you'd have to finish it for that. sure. But uh, you know, you're looking at eight foot ceilings like max here. Yeah, uh, which is fine. So nothing wrong with that. I I I be honest with you, it it. it it kind of depends on what he wants. It's hard to answer that question without mm. knowing how many people he's going to seat down there. I like the 19 by 13. It's a little bit more cozy. And it, yes. it, to me, it feels like it would be a little bit easier to uh, fill with sound and to finish off in a way that's just a nice, nice, nice rectangle. Yeah, well, not only that, yeah. if you if you go to the other side, which I can see the appeal in that it is a larger space to begin with, but the way those support columns yeah, are Yeah, they're everywhere, out, dude. <laughs> I mean, you're, you'd are you either end up with something blocking somebody's sight line or something yeah. like right where you want to put a speaker or want to put a seat. It's going to be really inconvenient to try and build around those support yeah. columns. So I would say go on the 19 by 13 side. That is a sufficient size. Granted, I don't think you'd want to have more than, say, a three-seater couch as the width of your seating if you yeah. want walkways on both sides now nothing says you have to have a walkway on both sides of your seating yeah you I, know? when you get into my home theater my seat is well it's got three seats but you can fit five people on that bad boy yeah easily five full-grown people but, but I mean, there's you know, probably a two two and a half foot walkway on one side mm -hmm. and when you open the door ain't nobody walking nowhere so you have to yeah. you have to walk you know but our door opens in but the door is recessed about a foot maybe a a little bit more than the foot yeah so that gives me a little bit extra room there but uh, if you had your door opening out you could put a you know a 10 foot couch in here you know uh and then you have a three foot walkway well not quite because right now it's oh well so it's it in his right. email he gave the exact dimension so it's just just a little bit shy of 13 feet wide without any finishing so yeah, that's actually one of his considerations. He's like, if he goes with a dedicated theater in his basement, he's worried about the width because he was like, if I go in the smaller room, how much space is he going to lose from the finishing process? He asked if he could maybe move the columns or work around them. Don't do that. Definitely don't, don't. try to move the columns. That is <laughs> major construction. And right, right, right. trying to work around them, I don't think is worth it. So on the other side there, where you've got a little bit less than 13 feet to begin with. Now, thankfully, this is all exterior wall. Right. I mean, other than what's beside yeah. his staircase and uh, maybe closing off the very back of the room, the other two walls are completely exterior walls, which means all you're putting up is basically framing to hold the drywall. Yeah. They don't have to be super soundproof because who cares if some of the sound leaks into the ground around your foundation. <laughs> so right. you could go with two by threes instead of two by fours for your framing. You can save an inch that way because two by threes are fine for just being the framing holding up your drywall. Um, you put a little bit of insulation in there, just the super cheap pink stuff, whatever. A single layer of regular drywall is fine for those walls. So you're right. taught, and so you would have two by threes, which are actually two and a half inches deep. You would want a one inch gap between the already excellent spray foam insulation that's already all over your exterior walls. One inch gap between that and the and the frame. So that's three and a half inches plus half inch drywall. That's four inches on those two walls. So you haven't lost very much there. And then on the stairway side, if you want to make it soundproof, I would just put up either sound clips with hat channels and maybe two layers of drywall i don't even know if that's necessary i think sound clips with hand channels and a hat channels and uh one layer of drywall or resilient channel and one layer of drywall would be fine for your interior walls because it's not actually going into another room it's going to the stairwell 
And he's looking at uh, this ceiling section here is uh -huh. going to be lower because of this ducting. Well, why but not leave it the way it is yeah. and just do a drop ceiling there? And oh, you could do that too, yeah. You know what I mean? Therefore, you're not having to finish the roof at all, really. The ceiling, yeah. The ceiling. Yeah, just you're drop just going to yeah, just, just put a drop ceiling in it. It's very convenient. It's going to save you some cost as far as that's concerned. Yeah. And then uh, up there, you can put as much insulation as you want. Yeah. Now, if you did only drop ceiling, I would suggest going for the actual acoustical ceiling yes. tiles, not yes. the super yes. cheap tiles. So that does increase the price over a standard drop ceiling, but it's still, still going to be cheaper than, yeah. Yeah. Than, than doing than. two layers of drywall with resilient channel and all that and building soffits around everything like that. If you just did, yeah, a drop ceiling there, you'd still have access to all that HVAC and electrical that might be running right. up there, which is a great thing to have. You go for you don't the have acoustical... To worry. You, you, you don't have to worry about running wires ever again up there. That's it's right. Yeah, super easy. Super pop easy to run wires. Pop a tile off, look around, grab the wire, pull it down. You're good to yeah. go. So uh, I think we're in agreement. We think that using that side of the room in your basement as your dedicated theater would be a good idea. If you decide to go with the basement, because okay. there is still the option of staying upstairs. Okay. So uh, he says if a cedar is going to stay in the in-law suite, he'd like to end up with 7.2.4 Atmos setup. So how could he achieve that with the uneven ceilings and the skylight fan and can lights and all that garbage? Um, honestly, it's a little bit more difficult to do everything you're talking about and have it look clean the way you want mm. it to be. But the reality is it's still the same. It's all the same measurements. You just find the point on the wall where it intersects. Yeah. So if you wanted your 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 speakers, your Atmos speakers to be three feet in front of you, or let's say five feet, five feet in front of you and five feet behind you, or doing uh, top fronts and top rears or something mm -hmm. like that. Let's just say you were going to do that. We're not saying that that's what's going to happen, but let's say you were. Top fronts, top rears, right? Well, you say, okay, well, five feet in front of me would be there, Then, but the wall angles down in front of me, so where on that wall would intersect with that line mm -hmm. that would go to the end of that five foot in front of me? Then put a speaker there. And for me, in this room, it makes the most sense because that's probably right there on the ceiling it's going to be almost impossible to run wires and all that stuff get mm. flat wire paintable flat oh, yeah, wire yeah, yeah run that right up the wall on the surface and then, yeah on the surface and then put a the like it's tiny speakers like uh ht super zeros get the the, the little the, little birds little birds whatever I, mean, I think little birds would be a great choice with a weird uneven ceiling like this because you can angle yeah. them like any angle you want with that pivot yeah. mount so that yeah. makes it quite simple. You could angle it so that even though your roof is at an angle, they, they're aiming straight down if you want them to, or you can aim them a little bit toward your seat, whatever you want to do. Pivot mount makes it simple. Right. So, yeah. So for me, uh, there's no reason why you can't keep that upstairs. So mm -hmm. the question becomes, now, as far as the downstairs, you're looking at now probably to be safe, a nine foot or nine and a half foot couch. And that's what we did when my wife and I went. Mm -hmm. We decided we could fit a 10 foot couch in here would be the max. And we found a 10 foot couch mm -hmm. that set, set everybody and had all the features that we wanted and everything. Okay. There's, you just go to a furniture store and say, I'm not looking for anything that's not, you know, and go to the home theater section Yep. because they're all modular. Like what you see yeah. is not what you get. You can say, I want three seats that look like the, the this seat right here. So I want one that has an arm on the left, one that has an arm on the right, and one in the middle. And they, you add it together, you're like, that's nine feet. And you're good. Or you can get the bigger ones, or you can put armrests in between or whatever, mm -hmm. and make it a little bit longer or whatever you want. So for me, what I would do is shove one side up against the wall as far away from... Yeah, you could you know, do that. And, and then... You know, that's the, the the good seat ends up becoming, if it's like a, th a three or four seater couch, let's say it's a four seater couch, but it's, you know, there's smaller seats. It's going to be the third seat away from the wall. Yeah. Will be yeah, your I best, mean, you need a walkway seat. on at least one side, but as long as you, have, you, it, don't you don't have both. to have it on both, you don't have to, it yeah. doesn't have to be symmetrical. And with a 19 foot length of the room, you could fit two rows of seats if you wanted to. You could even have a two foot false wall, then sit 10 feet away for your first row, uh, yeah. another five and a half to six feet behind that, which puts the second row very close to the back wall, but that's your secondary spillover seating anyway. So if you wanted the guy two rows clearly, of seats, you could. You know, he clearly in his current theater has two seats that are spillover oh, yeah. seating yeah, not, for, not that are not optimally in place. Shove that second row of seats on the back wall. Yeah. Call it a day. Yeah. You know, it, 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 to me, that makes the most sense. I mean, I, but, I think that the basement, if you want to do it like dedicated, you can yeah. basically have a perfect rectangle. There's no reason you can't build a perfect yeah. rectangle in that space. So I think it's very viable to do it in that 19 by 13 side. 
But I don't want to say that you can't do either one. You have the option sure. of doing either one. So the, the question becomes, what, what are you really looking for? You look, it, yeah. How does your theater sound right now? If, are you really happy with what you have? If you're really happy with what you have, then and all you really want to do is add Atmos, then there's a certainly a much less expensive than building out your basement way of adding Atmos to your home theater. That's, That's true. That's certainly doable. But if what you really want is like, I want... A dedicated theater. I want mm -hmm. more sound control. I want the you know better bass in there. I want to have a bigger screen, which you cannot have mm -hmm. in the current setup. Yeah, you have. yeah. The current the setup basement, makes it tricky for the screen for sure. Then the basement is the way to go. Yep. So really, the question then comes back on you: What do you really want, and is what's worth it to you? So we, I just want to make sure that we're not you know obviously from our perspective the dedicated home theater it gives you the bigger screen gives you more mm -hmm. gives you better uh, acoustics and everything else makes everything a little bit easier but it's a lot more expensive so oh, yes, we're not the expensive. one spending the money so you, you need to come to us and tell us what it, what really you decided to do so he says his current subwoofer is HSU VTF 15H it's a first generation uh, so it's on a Mark III or whatever the heck it is now <laughs> he'd like a second sub for more uniform bass his wife would like something smaller what would we recommend uh <laughs> okay, something smaller? I don't know. How big is this? It's a 15. It's probably one of those with three ports in the front or something like that. It's uh, well, it's got the two ones, right? sort of triangular ports in the bottom Ooh, corners. Is I don't what like they... that one. Yeah. I don't like it... the way that I don't like, I never liked the way that one looked. It looks funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, if you're looking for smaller footprint, the, the, the cylinders are the way to go for yeah, most. Yes. Yeah. And that 12. Uh, 12 the, plus. It, 12 plus or whatever is the is probably uh, applicable to this. Now, if you're in a 19 by 13 foot room, I mean, mm. you don't really need that level. You of You don't output. need that much base. You don't need that much subwoofer. You don't need as much subwoofer as you currently own. This in fact, true. in his what's the, the room he's got right now, he doesn't need that much base. Either. This is also true. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, none of the none of the even if you went for the big room, you don't really need a 15 H in there, and and don't go for the big room because of those support columns. Right. 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 So yeah, you don't. So really, I mean, you could go he with the. Has it. So yeah. <laughs> And you've nice already sub. got it. It is a nice sub, but if you sold it and got two smaller yeah. subs, you know, for a, a similar or you know a price, you can maybe save some space that way as well. Possibly. So I mean, if you and what's his, I, I forgot what his current room is. I need to scroll up to figure out what it is. What is his current room? His current uh, room's so the in-law suite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where are we here? Um, do, 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 do. Twenty-one by fourteen. Oh, geez, twenty-one by fourteen. You could get away with a you know. Uh, a 1000 series from SVS. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. 2000 would be nice. But uh... I mean, I mean, to just to be, I mean, obviously, if he's got as much base as he's got right now, he's probably going to want the bigger one. But the 2000 series of uh, sealed box 2000, you'd have two small subs. You could. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, his current sub is uh, about uh, 18 wide and 26 deep and about two feet wow, tall. It's big. So, um, <laughs> now, if, if you wanted slightly smaller as in uh 22 inches deep instead of 26 and 17 inches wide instead of 18 and 23 inches high instead of 25 uh you could go over to power sound audio and get one of their 15 v's because that's very comparable in terms of output and price uh but i don't know if that is significantly smaller enough right to uh right. to satisfy what your wife is going for i agree that the cylinder is probably like if if you're just like i want something that can equal the output of the of the vtf 15 h uh then the pc 12 plus from svs but although that's more expensive it's a couple hundred dollars more expensive yeah uh but it gives you the cylinder form factor which definitely takes up less floor space uh yeah so either do that or possibly downsized to two smaller subs. Yeah, and if you end up doing the downstairs stuff too, remember you're gonna be able to put one of these subs behind the. If you do a false wall, if you, you do a do false it, wall, it behind, you could do it behind the false wall. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, as uh, mentioned, he'll be using the in-law suite for a, a while, no matter what. So, what he'd like to install uh, the six acoustic panels that he already owns, if possible. Could he use panels to cover the skylights, maybe with some sort of magnetic system, so they can be removed if desired? Uh, what should his other? Where should his other panels go? First, reflection points and any suggestions for covering the big window? Just heavy blackout curtains, maybe. Uh, for the windows, yes, just uh, blackout curtains are the way to oh, go. Yeah. They're not that, not that expensive. No. Uh, the mine have like rings. Mm -hmm. and you just roll them on there and yes you get a little light at the top and the bottom but whatever it doesn't really matter uh that, that as far as covering the skylights you don't want to 100 cover them because you don't want to have like some sort of 
condensation going on. Yeah, you do need the the air to still be able to get in there. Although, I mean, these are just acoustic panels, so you're not stuffing them into there. So it should be fine. It should be yeah. Fine. So if if you install some sort of you know rare earth magnet, neodymium magnet or whatever, on there, so that just snaps into place. I don't know if I holds... go magnet. I just go hooks, man. Just hooks like Z clips. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's Four no reason Z-clips. why you have. To... You yeah, need. there's no reason why you have to. Do... But I'm just saying. I mean, it's... It's a... he could do it that, that I way. Guess. I guess. I wouldn't want to trust panels on an angled ceiling to magnets. So I I just go four Z clips, man. The four corners. Of each I would panel. trust it to Magnus. You got Neodymium magazine coming off, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you could do a couple of things here. Now, I don't know why you're trying to cover your skylights in particular. If it's a light based thing, then if you're buying blackout curtains, just buy one more or two more, depending yeah. on how big those windows are, and just cover those windows, cover, cover that area. Just literally, like, pull your TV forward a little bit and hang a curtain that just hangs down behind your TV. It covering those two skylights, if that's really the issue. Uh, you know, as far as panels, you know, there's uh, nothing in this room. So behind your couch, if at all possible, there's, you know, bef- you know that hallway back there to the, if you're facing the hallway to the right there, as close to the edge as you can go, I would put one there. I can't see what, if there's a light switch or something, it's very hard to see. There's some marks on that back wall. Yeah that I can't quite see. So you could put some there. I would also consider putting something in the hallway if you could. Because yes. there's a lot of yep. there's a lot of base that's gonna be bouncing around back yep. there kinda willy nilly. So I would do that. I would also corner trap that rear left corner. So behind your couch and if you're facing the hallway all the way to the right corner there, but it's really the rear left corner because there's your left speakers back there or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I would base trap that because that's really the only corner that you can do easily. Uh, the other thing that you can consider doing is moving your entire uh, uh, TV in this little stand thing forward a little bit, which I already kind of suggested for the blackout curtains. And then uh, along that small half wall at the bottom there, just put panels across the whole bottom part of that just to uh, as sort of like corner trapping along the floor. Hmm. That's what I would do. All right. One of the left left wall at the first reflection point, right wall at the first reflection point. If you can, I can't really tell where the reflection points are. Yeah. Behind behind the surround speakers, maybe. Yeah, I'd Actually. mainly focus on behind you, maybe some in front of you there. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Mark. Mark is in the third redesign of his home theater and suddenly has the urge to shake his rump as only the magic of tactiles transducers can. <laughs> he already bought a single AST 2BF, I'm sorry, 4, not 2BF, 2B, 2B4, Aura Sound Pro Bass Shaker and a Dayton Audio SA70 subwoofer plate amp to drive it. Now he wants to buy one more bass shaker for another seat. Will the SA70 be enough to power both or will he need a second amp? When I looked up the specs for your base shaker, it says it takes like 50 or 60 yeah, watts. Yeah, 50 watts max, and it's that's 4 ohms, so 50 watts That's 4, 4 ohms, max. and the SA70 puts out 70 watts at 4 ohms. Yes. It's not, it's like 40 watts at 8 ohms. Yes. So, uh, I, I mean, I would get a second amp, to be honest with you. I mean, it's probably going to be fine, depending yeah, on... Yeah, it'd probably be fine work. driving two of them. I I mean, you really don't need a ton of power for a base shaker when it's yeah. one base shaker for one seat. Um, yeah, you really don't need a ton. So I, I'd i say it's fine. I'd probably just wire them up in series because I don't want a two-ohm load right. in particular. So i just wire them up in series. I'd say it's fine to drive two of them if it's like one shaker per one seat. Yeah. Right. It depends on how much it's moving, I suppose. Uh what if he wants to add a third or fourth shaker? Would he just wire them all in series to the lone SA70? The, a combination of series and parallel. At what point should he buy a second SA70 amp? Once you have more than two. <laughs> I would think so. I mean, I, I honestly, I would probably err on the side of caution and just have an individual amp for each one myself, if that's what I was doing. Because these amps are not that expensive. They're this is fairly true. inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, and it just ensures that you're not dealing with any sort of issues. So what he's talking about here, for those of you that understand, so uh, when you wire something in series, it doubles the ohmage. So it yeah, goes so if you from have two devices that are four ohms each. You now have a single eight ohm load if you wire them in series. So if you want to keep the 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 load around what you around what the amp is sort of rated for and that sort of thing, you can uh, wire some in series and some in parallel because mm-hmm. parallel will half 
the homage. So it'll go down to two from four to two. Yeah. So if you go up to eight and then you then you half it, it goes down back down to four and all this other stuff. So you can do stuff, tricks like that electrically to wire a bunch of stuff to one amplifier. I don't necessarily think it's... The, I mean, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I'm sure there are people who listen to this who are saying, oh, so it's fine, or oh my God, you're going to set your house on fire. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that question is. So the answer to... Uh, my answer is, I might per, personally would buy one amp per. Rob's saying one amp for every two is probably yeah, fine. one amp for, so. for two I'd be fine with, but I, I wouldn't yeah. try to drive three or four with one of those amps. Yeah. So he's asked you to build a small box for the amplifier. He's not really sure where to put it other than maybe laying it on the shelf in his av rack any better ideas yeah i just put it right behind the the couch <laughs> or underneath right. it in some well, way he does he does have a seating riser so i was like could you like kind of build it install into it in your the riser, riser? Yeah, yeah just cut a hole in your riser and yeah. shove it in there sure that's that was uh, my thought I, I, I I would my thought was just tuck it someplace where you can't see it because who mm. cares it's it's a it's a plate amp yeah uh, it's not getting that hot you don't have to worry about setting anything on fire it's it's, it's you know, yeah. it's a switching amplifier most of the time. So I if I were going to do time. anything, I would maybe like, if you just wanted something where you could have it sort of like standing on its own, I would maybe make a frame out of wood that doesn't look too ugly. I would leave the back completely open. So I would just like make a frame that's basically the same perimeter as the plate right. amp itself. I'd secure the plate amp with its screw holes onto that frame and that would be it. Because yeah. now I have a free, so it's not just like the raw electronics of the back of the plate amp in contact with anything. You have a right. frame to give it a little bit of depth, but that's all I would. And then you could just lay it flat in a rack, or you could stand it up against a wall, or whatever. That's that's about as much as I would do yeah. for it to make yeah. a frame. The new layout, uh, uh, the new layout has left some of his speaker wires about ten feet short. He doesn't really want to rerun whole new wires, so would it be okay to use a simple twist splice and some electrical tape with the pieces of the same? speaker wire to make up the extra 10 feet is it likely to cause issue with audio transmission or quality the answer to that question is no it's not likely to cause any issues that i can think of uh i've done it before <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know i mean it's I, it's not the proper way to do it the proper no. way to do it is with one of our favorite things the butt splice Yes, the butt splice. The butt splice, which you can order packages of little butt splice connectors, which all these are. It's like a little tube with a little bit of metal in it. You put one end of the wire into one end. You put the other end of the wire into the other end. You crimp down on the little piece of yeah. metal that's inside to hold it tight. And then it has shrink tubing that you just run a hair dryer, or if you have an actual heat gun, uh, you just right. run that over there and shrink down the shrink tubing. And there you have a nice secure connection where... So the so-called danger of just twisting the wire together and putting electrical tape around it is that it will expand and contract due to the heat, which can... Yeah, you would, you would put like a wire nut on there if you were going to do it yeah, that way anyway. So but you, you can end up potentially with, you know, some loosening of that connection over time, which could eventually lead to an arc. It's not impossible. So given how cheap little butt splice connectors are, and if you just want to pick up one or two, run down to your local car audio shop because they have yeah. a gazillion. In fact, they'll probably just give you a couple if that's all you need because they have a gazillion of them. So... Proper way, butt splice connector. That's it. Butt splice. Butt splice. James. Butt splice. <laughs> James has his theater uh, area set up in his living room, but the rest of his house is pretty open, so he's dealing with something around a bajillion cubic feet. <laughs> He said 10,000, but might as well be yeah. Bill's show you. He has a couple of epic brand subwoofers. I'm sorry, sir. One of their dual 15-inch drivers uh, sealed models, plus another dual driver ported model. The ported model blew out and stopped working. And as we know, and Rob really knows, he is. Epic went out of business, leaving a lot of complaining customers. The sealed model is still chucking along, though. He's using clip speakers, and he likes to crank his setup for both movies and music. He's sealed. His sealed Epic Sub gives a nice chest kick, and it digs low. But the really low stuff doesn't stay as loud. The ported model that blew up used to play louder, but it also sounded boomy. Again, sorry, sir. The So James is looking for an upgrade. He wants it all. He wants it super loud, super low, and super clean. He'd rather overbuy since he only wants to make his purchase once and then have it be good for the space uh for this space or any future spaces and he's willing to spend upwards of three thousand dollars rhythmic and power sound audio both have big 18 inch models even dual 18 inch uh driver models svs has their pb16 ultra but then there's the uh, question of whether he should have a pair of subwoofers well yeah you should have a pair of subwoofers we only have a subwoofer i mean and but i honestly 
I still think there's enough people out there who are interested in Epic that you could probably sell that Epic. You know, there's oh, yes. still people people who uh, drank the Kool Aid and oh, did they ever? The Epic and. In, in full disclosure here, Rob drank the Kool-Aid a little bit himself. It worked on me. It was one he, of my learning experiences. That's right. We've all done it. We've all done it. Everybody, sure every single one of us that has listening to this podcast or doing this podcast has has gotten hyped on the hype. And I, bought, up... I bought a Monster Cable Power Conditioner at one point. Worked on me back then. I was a teenager. Yeah. I... I can't honestly believe that I, I can't believe I can't remember uh, ever buying a monster product on purpose mm. uh, that I can think of, but I probably have bought some cables lean here or there from time to time. Uh, before, yeah, again, I was in college. So uh, as far as what if you a pair of speakers here, yeah, power sound auto audio is probably one of my go-tos here you're going to get a very big subwoofer that is i mean these are the, S the same guys that started svs so i trust them Originally, to, yeah. uh i trust them to be able to give you a sub that will play low and play loud and play you know relatively cleanly uh not really cleanly but uh have good good performance bring you know, frequency response and everything else so uh i could go with an eight one of those 18 inch models from them i think I'd yes okay right, power sound audio has a model called the v1801 so that yeah. is one of their single 18 inch driver models now nicely it's 1400 dollars, which means you could get a pair of them for your three thousand dollar budget there you go um now as far as its output is concerned it falls basically it's a little bit louder than the old PB13 Ultra that SVS used to okay. sell, which is now replaced by the PB4000. It's not quite as loud as the 16 Ultra. So it's sort of in between those two, uh, which is very, very loud output. Uh, and what's nice is you could get a pair of them. So even placing them across the room from one another, you get an additional about three decibels of output. So the pair of these 18, v 1801s should get you right around the same output level as, say, a single PB16 Ultra. That's sort of the output level that you're looking at with those. Uh, and I would think that's quite appropriate for your space. Now, if... If you want to go nuts, because he was like looking at the dual 15-inch vented rhythmic or the dual 18-incher from Power Sound Audio, because <laughs> those things exist. If you want to get into that kind of territory, I would actually prefer that you get a JTR subwoofer. Okay. Because those are basically meant for outdoors. Uh, they have one which is their Captivator 2400 Ultra Low Frequency. It's $2,500. But it can output 116 decibels from two meters away at 20 hertz, okay? <laughs> which is louder than any of the subs we've been talking about. They're all around 113 decibels. So this thing is like twice as powerful as right. even the PB16 Ultra. Now, they have one it's that's a... even bigger, the 4000 ULF, which gets you to 119 decibels at 20 hertz, but that one's over $4,000. So yeah. if, if you want to go absolutely nuts, I, I could back a Captivator 2400. Um, they have a smaller one, the Captivator 1400, but it's $2,000 and right about the same output level as the PB16 Ultra or the V1801. So since you can get a pair of V1801s from power sound audio for your price range that's kind of my number one choice for you um, yeah i mean heck if you discover that you don't really need them across the room for more uniform base you could stack them and now you have a dual 18 incher that can get three decibels or six decibels louder in that right. case right. so uh so i like the dual v1801s the most but if you just want a, an earth shattering sub there is the captivator from jtr yeah i don't think you should go for that one but you do what you gotta do dude yeah Michael on Facebook, Denon and Marantz have said that the firmware update to add Dolby Vision and HLG pass-through for older AV receiver models is now all set to be released in summer 2018. But Michael has connected his Oppo UDP203 Ultra HD Blu-ray player to his Denon X4300H receiver, which then fed his LG C6P OLED. And when he plays a Dolby Vision movie, the Dolby Vision indicator pops up on his TV that seems to be in Dolby Vision mode. So he's missing something. Is or is his X forty three hundred H already passing through Dolby Vision somehow? I don't know. I don't have Dolby Vision. So X forty three hundred H is passing through Dolby Vision. It is the Yay. ones from a model year prior. So it was the X sixty two hundred, the X forty two hundred on the Morant side, it was the SR sixty ten and SR seventy ten. Uh those are the models where they've been saying Dolby Vision is coming. It's 
summer of 2018 now. That's the date that they're saying. So those were, uh, yeah, AV receivers that came out in, uh, I guess, yeah. 2016. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, your 4300H, that one came out last year. That one already got the update. So you're not missing anything. Yeah. You're getting Dolby Vision pass through. Hooray. Me too. You are. Well, I don't have it, but that's making a difference. Yeah. Uh, hold on a second here. Joe, hypothetical question for fun. If we had a completely unlimited budget, which designer would we hire to design our dream home theater? Joe's options are Tony Grimani. 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 Yeah. Uh, Russ, Anthony Grimani, yeah. Whatever. Russ uh, Herschelman. Dennis Erkson. Erkson. Erskine. Floyd Tool. Theo Calamarcus, whatever. <laughs> Keith Yates, yeah. whatever. And Rich Green. Who else will we add to the list? Rob, go. All right. You know what? If I had a completely unlimited budget, I would yeah. talk to Wilfred Van Balen, the guy who does Oro 3D. Because the studio that he built for himself, for his recording studio and mastering studio that he built for the Oro 3D yeah. stuff, that is that is a dream room. He, It's like... T like literally when i say tons literally tons of poured concrete the entire thing is on big springs to separate it from the ground below uh it's a like when we say room within a room it's like a bunker within a bunker all right so uh, like yeah he's got like i, I, I think the, the glass window because it is like a control room setup i think the yeah, glass yeah. i think he said it's like 18 inch thick glass or something like that like, this thing is a bomb shelter, man. Now, you said completely unlimited budget. Let's go nuts. So I'm, I'm going to go talk to Wilfred Van Balen. Now, for all the stuff inside of my theater, I uh, I would want to talk to the JBL synthesis guys from Harmon. The, the, yeah. the, that's that's who I would want to have in there. I'd want to have Todd Welty and Sean Olive. I'd want Kevin Vakes from Revel in on this. Those are, those are the guys I'd like to talk for about all the gear inside and for building the room. I'd want to talk to Wilfred. There you go. I I don't. No, no, I wouldn't do any of this stuff. <laughs> if I had unlimited budget, if I had unlimited budget, I'd still do it myself. I'd be honest with yeah. you. I'd, well, I'd, I'd still I'd want still... to do a lot. And I'm not uh, like one of the reasons I wouldn't hire, say, Dennis Erskine. Uh, not that right. he doesn't make beautiful theaters, but he likes to hide all the equipment. I want to see all the equipment, which not that Dennis couldn't do that. Obviously, he could. But why would I hire right. a guy whose expertise is hiding stuff behind beautiful things when I want to see it? So, yeah. And I'm sort of... You know, I'm I'm sort of kind of the same way. I've been I've seen a lot of theaters that look really super clean and really super nice and like or have themes and stuff like that. You know, the Batcave or whatever. Right, right, right. And that's just not me. Yeah, that's not me. I I don't like. On I take the wall grills off my speakers so I can see the drivers. You know, I'm the same way, and I would do it in here, but uh, it's a pain to get these grills off of these right. uh, various grants. So, uh, I I would uh, I would end up not I would have. Obviously, I would I would get a designer. I would probably talk to a couple of people and, and do some research to figure out which one I think would do what I'd want. But uh, I would spend more time just listening to speakers and getting you know doing all that stuff. For me, the fun of it is is that is coming up with what you what you think is perfect and then implementing it. Now, do I want to do the construction myself? Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. I don't also don't want like this perfectly uh, clean you know everything hidden nothing you know it, it looks like it's too nice to eat popcorn in yeah you know, you know what i mean <laughs> I mean, my, my theater right now currently has uh three blankets i can see a bat uh, uh, a box of tissues uh, a computer charger lying on the floor which i have no idea what it's from i know for a fact my son my 14 year old son's shoes are on the floor behind the the, the main couch and my son lost my middle son lost his belt in here for three days it was just on the floor. He just yep. didn't look for it. So, you know, that's the kind of theater I have, and that's the kind of theater I want. Carl. Carl asks, what do we think of Bose's augmented reality platform? Audio augmented reality platform, excuse me. Rather than focusing on uh, overlaying video information, Bose is proposing overlaying audio information that responds to what you're looking at, uh, where you are via GPS, and how your head is moving. Do we foresee audio AR being just as or perhaps even more useful than video AR? Uh, I don't think that you can separate the two. I don't see how you can. Mm. You know, uh, yes, I, I, Bose, of course, is going to be talking more about how, you know, whatever. It's like Apple, you know, like, hey, we can unlock stuff with our face. We just invented it. I'm like, no, you didn't. And Bose <laughs> did not invent uh, audio AR. You know, AR is, by definition, is where you're looking. I mean, we see this in, 
Heck, this happened last night in the movie, at the very beginning of Thor uh, Ragnarok. There's the part where he's talking with the big flaming dude with the sword. Mm -hmm. When the camera's pointing at him, you can hear the sword coming from one speaker. When the camera flips sides and the sword's dragging on the ground from coming in from a different area of the room. That is audio, you know, AR. That's what it is. And that's what you should be experiencing. So if you if you have VR, video... Uh, 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 video uh, augmented reality VAR I guess we would call that uh, you can you can't not have audio mm. augmented reality you have to or it just won't it won't seem real yeah it'll be weird to have video overlays without any additional audio whatsoever right You're normally gonna I mean even if it's just bings and chimes and stuff you right. would think you'd want something to go along if it's going to be some kind of interface or alert system or something like that. Um, I mean, and, and they're coming up with things like, oh, we're going to do this via what you're looking at and via GPS. Well, yeah. yeah. What do you think Google that's, Glass was that, doing? That's, I mean, how, that's, that's pretty that's much how, how it works. That's how augmented reality works. <laughs> I mean, I mean, big deal. It's like, you know, if, if you didn't use that, what else were you going to use? Mm. I mean, accelerometers, it's still basically the same thing. It's... It doesn't make any sense. What? So, yes. Well, I mean, th I, that said, I have no problem with as many companies as want to yes. getting on all the various acts, aspects. I mean, yes, augmented reality is definitely going to be a thing that we're all going to use in the future. I have zero doubt of that. I mean, we already are to a fairly large extent, mostly through our cell phones. But, sure. But, you know, uh, eventually some interface. I mean, we're, we're going to have the little contact lenses that you can wear that put, you know, overlays on top of stuff eventually. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the audio is going to be a side of that. I have zero problem with Bose being a part of that equation and working on it. Maybe they can use some of their noise-canceling stuff to help isolate certain sounds because they, they are very good at the noise-canceling stuff. There's no question about it. They got a ton of patents on that. So, yeah, yeah it, great. <laughs> the more, the merrier. That's my opinion. Yeah, the, we, we only stop thinking more the merrier when it comes time to come, come out with a format and then they start arguing right. about whose format's best. What we really want is just research on how to do it best and yeah. then have somehow... Maybe actually have the patent system work the way it was designed where the patent does expire eventually and everyone else can start using the thing. Yeah. Right, right. Chris. Chris is tempted to buy... Uh, by the buy one get one deal free de I'm sorry buy one get one deal at that accessories for less is running on their Focal Superbird speakers but if you bought a pair he'd want to use them as overhead speakers can the Superbirds be ceiling mounted and would it be a good idea anything could be ceiling mounted if you try hard enough yes you okay. could ceiling so mount some towers if you really went for if it if you really wanted to you <laughs> could do it and I think I actually talked about that one time on this podcast about hanging towers from a ceiling well I know but we've talked about to... subwoofers <laughs> ceiling mounted yeah subwoofers. we've done that but I'm talking this was back with Dina this is how long ago uh, that was where I, I was like the guy didn't want to have anything on the floor but you know oh yeah blah, chain blah, blah, hanging blah. chain <laughs> chain hanging the, the, the towers but you'd have to hang them upside down so the tweeters would be at the there right level go. I'm like you could do it Mm -hmm. It's insane, but you could do it. <laughs> it would look very strange. Uh, the Superbirds, are, are, uh, they are very big. <laughs> they are yeah, quite large. Yeah, they're bigger than you think. The birds they, are bigger than you think. From the the birds surprised me. Now, I'm used to them now, but when I first got them, I was like, these things are too big to be on my <laughs> ceiling. Now that they're up there, I'm not so worried about them. But for a long while, I was like, I have made a horrible mistake here. <laughs> the Superbirds are way too big. But... Who cares? They're buy one, get one. So, you know. Yeah, well, because I mean, well, even with the buy one, get one, a pair of them ends up being the same price as a pair of birds, which is $100 more than a pair of little birds, which are the real right. ones I would recommend. You for would probably mounting. suggest. Yeah. That was yeah, the little suggest. birds are very appropriate for ceiling mounting. So the super birds, they, they, they do come with a wall mount bracket because they're meant to be wall mounted. Right. It gives you the ability to, um, so if they were mounted on a wall as normal, it gives you the ability to pivot them left and right a little bit, but they don't right. really have any uh, up down tilt to them so if you mounted that to the ceiling and you could because there's no reason you couldn't put a wall mount connected to your ceiling instead um you know you have a little bit of adjustment from what would be the side to side but no forward backward tilt that's okay atmos speakers are supposed to fire straight down anyway right down anyways, yeah. um but they're heavy enough that i would definitely want to secure them either into joists or have the you know blocking that you would put in between a couple of joists and secure to that maybe i would do it with toggle bolts but i shouldn't certainly wouldn't do it with just wall anchors I, I wouldn't trust just wall anchors to hold them on the ceiling right um so i would go at, at a minimum toggle bolts if not directly into blocking or jo um 
or uh, I always try joist. to go directly into a a ceiling joist yeah. or a a two by four of some, even if it's only one. That's right. Uh, you know, even if you only get one screw into one of them, try to get one yeah. screw into one of them if you can. But honestly, if your goal is to put ceilings uh, speakers on the ceiling, I'd go for the little birds. That, that's yeah. the appropriate choice. Dan. Dan would like our take on a couple of products. A 12-pack of inexpensive one foot by one foot by one inch thick studio form with a wedge design. Studio and foam. The, yes, yes. Aftershocks Air, a Trex Air bone conduction headphones. Okay. <laughs> so the first one is a one foot by one foot by one inch thick studio form with a wedge design. Now, I have looked at this, and it, it, you will look at this and think to yourself, and because I've thought the same thing, this looks like something that should be in a recording studio. Therefore, it will be good for my home theater. The answer to that question is, no, it is not. It's almost it is. useless. It's, I mean, it's, it is for looks. Clo- if, if all you wanted was the aesthetic of it, okay. Yeah, it's not really doing much. And for no. $21, which is what it ships right now sure. with Prime, uh, you could better spend that money on literally anything else. Like so Raw I insulation. Would, I would rather yeah. buy a package of raw insulation. So, uh, yeah, I, I, we ha- we feel very, very strongly that this is a waste of money. This is not really, this is going to knock down the highest of the highs. Ugh, so Barely you, even that. When you see, when you see these things, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times they have them like around a microphone for people who are uh-huh. doing, uh, you know, stuff in a, in a room. A lot of times those same people have that same setup in a literal closet. Yeah, even with then they'd be going for at least the two-inch thick, not the one-inch yeah. thick. Yeah, with yeah. clothes still in it. So you're yeah. like, okay, yeah, really. Yeah, the clothes so are doing more. The than clothes the are doing more than the rest Foam of it. Foam is uh, it's next to useless. You, you want? Oh, I love it. I, oh yeah. Material. So I mean, every once in a while I'll see somebody that I like. Oh yeah, I've I've heard this even recently. Oh yeah, I put I've got this new thing and I bought a bunch of egg cartons because yeah, I'm gonna yeah, put yeah. egg cartons that I'm like, dude, you have. Can I have some of those eggs at least? Because I mean, if you're gonna throw away all the eggs, you know, you really got ripped. Now the Air- aftershocks, uh, Trex Air bone conducting headphones or bone mm-hmm. conduction headphones. I've used the- something like this before at a running store. So what okay. these are really used for is they don't go in your ears; they go right before your ears. Yeah. So they'll go behind your head, up around your ears, but they don't go into your ears. And the idea here for these things is that you get the sound, but you can still hear everything from the outside, which is important right. while you're running. Uh, they sound like garbage. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for sound quality, garbage, I think, would be the most accurate <laughs> way I would describe the sound quality of bone conduction headphones. Clearly, this is not the way we were meant to hear sound, which is why your voice sounds weird when you speak to yourself. When you listen back to it, you're like, that's not what I sound like. Everybody's right. like, yeah, of course it is. That's exactly what you sound like because it sounds completely different. You are hearing yourself through bone conduction, mostly, whereas everybody else is hearing you through air conduction, which is how it's meant to be. So these are great headphones if you're a runner and you're trying to stay safe and you want to make sure that you're not going to get run over by a car. But if you want to listen to music, then you should actually get headphones, especially like they're, they're, for $179, which yeah. is what these things cost. Like they're quite good and effective for giving you a beat. You know, oh, yeah. If, if, the, if this is for working out, uh, you know, rock climbing, um, being at a gym or whatever, and what you want is a beat to keep you yeah. motivated, they're, they're pretty darn good at that. Uh, but yeah, the sound quality of music as a whole, uh, I like one of the reviews saying, uh, it takes some getting used to. <laughs> like yeah. that is a very polite way of saying it. <laughs> the garbage is another way of saying it. They sound like garbage. But... That's not. They're not there to sound good. They're there to give you right. some music, a, a, a little bit of your music, and a lot of ability to hear everything around you. They're uh, these things are not are uh, unless somebody comes up with some technology that is beyond what we have right now, like considerably light years beyond what we have right now. These are a fad that will go away very quickly. <laughs> Bob. Bob's theater is set up in his open concept living room. This is a theme tonight. The living room is roughly 18 by 16, but it's open to another 31 by 9 for the kitchen and dining area. The ceiling is 7 foot 8 inches throughout. Overall, the space is sort of L-shaped, and Bob is sitting quite far away, a little over 16 feet from his 65-inch LG OLED. He has an L-shaped sofa and a recliner that faces the TV. So, yeah, this is like a traditional, like, uh, house. 
You know, this is just yeah. this is a big old uh, L shaped couch. Like when if you go to those those places where they they got the the big you know fabric covered couch that's in the sort of a, it's got a nice, you know, nice L curve to it. It's got a little curve there. This is good. And you're sitting a bajillion feet away from a what's 55, 60 inch TV. It looks 65 like 65. Yeah. 65 so uh yeah it's way too small and he's got the world's <laughs> smallest speakers too they're so small uh anyway so here we go he has upgraded components of his system over the years but he has continued to use his a 5.1 jbl speaker package with a jbl sat 10 speakers which i have experience with and a jbl base 15 subwoofer which i do not uh i think i had the 12 for that but it broke. Uh, it was my father's, actually. He is getting the itch to hear Atmos uh, now that he has an Ultra HD Blu-ray player and the HDR-capable display, but he has never actually heard Atmos in person before. He doesn't have a large budget, so if he was going to do this upgrade, he'd want to make it happen for a low price. He wouldn't feel comfortable t making holes in his ceiling himself, so he isn't particularly keen on the idea of speakers in or on his ceiling, as he'd need to pay somebody else to do that for him. Side wall mounting any speakers isn't going to work because of the layout of the room, so if he's going to install Atmos speakers, he's thinking either upward firing or mounting them as high as he can on his front and back walls. What do we think would be best, and perhaps even more importantly, do we think that it would even be worth it? Remember that he has no frame of reference when it comes to what Atmos is supposed to sound like. So will he notice the upgrade? Will it sound the way it should? Okay, first of all, your front speakers are absolutely fine. You could probably mount them to, from your ceiling with a thumbtack. So <laughs> if you are uncomfortable mounting speakers from your ceiling, don't be don't be you like can you're talking this. about taking the jbls he already owns yes and mounting and those up high on, put his on the ceiling on yes. the ceiling even yeah. on the ceiling yes the the, the speakers he currently has putting yep. them up there uh you you are sitting probably too far away uh in my in my estimation from a uh if okay let's take dolby at their word uh -huh. shall we and pretend that they really are bouncing sound off the <laughs> ceiling and it's not some sort of phase trick thing yeah, yeah. you are sitting too far away for bouncing to work you Agreed. are not sitting for too the, far for away the front, for the front for the front, front. yeah yeah uh you are not sitting too far away for a uh phase thing to work theoretically mm. you would need you would need whole new speakers and they would need to be further apart than they currently are but yeah so I have no. I, I. I believe me, sir. Let me. Let, let me tell you how. The, how the, the easiest way to make this thing work is what you would like. What you need to do is find the, what the place on your ceiling where you would like the speakers to hang from. About. Okay. About. Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take a drill, and you're going to drill a hole in your ceiling. Now I'm, I'm assuming you have an attic in this house. Okay. You're going to drill a hole in your ceiling where you want. You're going to take a very small drill bit and drill a very small hole. Then you're going to take a piece of very stiff wire or a coat hanger that you've you know, stretched out. Mm -hmm. You're going to shove it through that hole till it sticks up through the insulation like a, you know, a foot or so, so you can see it as you're going through your attic. Then you will know where your speaker is to be hung from. Mm -hmm. From there, you can you know, kind of get an idea. You, do, you want to get an idea of where your, uh, uh, your joists are, you know, you want to get someplace close to a joist there. You're going to hang the speaker from that joist using just regular old wood screws. You don't need anything special here. You're going to have to get a mount of some sort, depending on what those JBLs have. I thought uh, they are very compatible with just Pretty like every sure kind of Pretty sure those have just a keyhole mount on the back of them. So Yeah, so you can maybe just put a screw up there and just keyhole them in, but you would probably want to get a, a specific mount for it so that you could do some adjustments if you needed to. You would drill it right in there and you run the wire. You would, uh, you'd go up into your attic, running the wire, uh, taking the wire with you, and then uh, take it and uh, just uh, wrap it around that little uh, piece of wire or whatever you put up through there, and then pull it back through. You have now just run the wire to that spot. Now, I mean, really not that hard. Lots of people might not have the mobility to be right, able to go into right. their own attic or whatever. So, but what I would say, uh, if your seat is going to stay where it is, um, you could certainly try top middles, just having those mounted on your back wall because your seats are pretty close to your back wall, right? Are now. they really? I can't see the oh, yeah. seats on the back wall. If you look at the one where you can see the curve of his seat and you can see the recliner. Um, you know, those, the, those seats are close to the back wall. So you could have top middles installed and try just a, in this case, 5.1.2 setup to start. Right. Just to see if the 
uh, you know, speakers more or less directly above you. They're ever so slightly behind you. Again, you, you could use those you. same speakers you have up front. So that would For work. For sure. Uh, you know, so you could quite easily do that. And then if you're like, hey, I kind of like this overhead effect that I'm getting from just these two speakers, then for your what would end up having to be called front heights, uh, you know, I would not have them on the front wall just up high. That's too far away. And I would yeah. not try the upward firing ceiling bounce thing. I would mount your front height speakers in the correct locations, which would be about maybe six feet in front of your seating location. That's where you would mount them on the ceiling. And if you cannot do it yourself, that is not, you know, there are lots of people you could hire to do that. Just a couple of speakers into your ceiling. It, yeah, that's not, it really, really shouldn't cost you two. that much. That's yeah, right. Yeah, it, it shouldn't cost that much. So they just have to run the wire to the you know to the location basically what i just said yeah. and then down the wall into uh uh the wall bay right behind your receiver yeah, where, where, you, where your, your equipment lives is. yeah yeah so i would i would start with a 5.1.2 by mounting yeah. uh, on your back wall and above you give that a try if you like those results consider adding two speakers on your ceiling that's what i would yeah. suggest you have to buy some new speakers regardless if he does Atmos, uh, the Atmos upgrade. So do we think his JBL speakers are still up to the task of being his mate? No. Uh, or perhaps he should use four out of five of his JBL speakers as his wall-mounted Atmos speakers and upgrade his 5.1 speaker package. Again, he's looking to keep the price low. So what we suggest, front three speakers, replace your front three speakers. Mm -hmm. Everything else is, I think, fine. Because I you're mean, sitting he, close he, enough to him. He might end up using four out of the five JBLs as his overhead yeah. speakers, in which case he would basically need five new speakers around. I would well, I like to, to upgrade start that with. sub too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, really yeah. The sub, is, the sub absolutely has to go too as well. But uh, yeah, your, your front three speakers have to go. So you want to take those front three speakers and get rid of those. Uh, just hold them because like, like we said, we could yeah. be using those for other things. Yeah. So we can take the uh, center channel and not worry about that. You could just take it someplace you're going to use your your front left and rights that you're using right now as your first overhead speakers and i do agree with rob that even if you were sitting in the middle of the room i would go with front middles to start with because mm -hmm. if you're only going to mount two speakers to start with yeah, go ahead and mount middles, those yeah. two and then see if it makes enough of a difference for you to care about it and then you go on with your life from there then uh yeah, the, the speakers I like, you're gonna you're sitting quite far away. So you need mm -hmm. something that can uh, handle some power and give you some output. And whenever we think of stuff like that, we'll often think of horn-loaded speakers. So yeah. if you were into something that looked like an ugly box, you could get uh, the HSUs. Yeah. Those ones would work, uh, I think, pretty well. Of course, Klipsch, if you want to buy something locally and you don't want to do something online, you want to go listen to them, you could go listen to some Klipsch. I would not got, get Klipsch from their entry-level whatever icon. Icon, no, don't get these. those. Get, you know, the reference yeah. series would be fine. The reference speakers would be fine, yeah. Which you don't I realize, have to go crazy. Yeah, the name reference sounds like it's high up the line, but That's their is entry like, level. That's their entry, <laughs> yeah, because then there's reference premiere above that and then reference two above reference premiere. So yeah. reference is like kind of their entry. Uh, yeah. I agree. I think the HSUs would be a great choice in here. The HB1 Mark IIs horn loaded. Um, I also think RBH's new impression series would be sure. a good here. Uh, they're not as efficient, but they are very high power handling. One thing I really like about uh, RBH is they actually put protection on their tweeters. So it's really, really hard to blow up an RBH tweeter because they actually protect them, which not enough <laughs> speaker manufacturers do that. Uh, Aperion does it as well, so that's nice. Um, yeah. Now, if you were like, I just want to get a 5.1 package and I still want them to be small and I still want it to be affordable and I would like to get a subwoofer at the same time, taking a look at RSL would be uh, not a bad idea because they have some nice 5.1 sure. or 5.2 speaker packages. They're pretty compact speakers, not as small as your current JBLs. They're bigger than those, but right. they're still quite compact. And that Speedwoofer 10 that they sell is a pretty nice $400 sub. You know, so it would be an upgrade from what you have without going insane. Yeah. So RSL, RBH, HSU, Klipsch, those are our suggestions to you. Yeah. He'll need an Atmos receiver as well. Which one do we recommend? Well, you're going to need 5.2.4. Ideally, yeah. Just to make sure that you don't want to add, you don't want to buy a 5.2.2 max out because then you'll end up. Then you're stuck. Uh, <laughs> stuck. You'll have to, you'll have to, if you decide to add some more speakers, uh, so, I mean, are the X3300 still on sale? Are those still... Well, the X3300 tops out at 5.1.2. Oh, do they really? So yeah, you get the 4300. The then. 4300, yeah. So uh, the 4300, X4300, 
You can still find refurbished ones for $800. Um, accessories for Less is out of stock right now. But One Call, which is another very good retailer, uh, they sell through an Amazon marketplace or directly at onecall.com. Uh, they have refurbished X4300s for $800. The, uh, Amazon only says, I think, four of them left in stock right now. So they're, they're selling out because it was nine just a day ago. So people have found them, apparently, and are snapping those up. But uh, yeah, X4300, that's what I'd go for. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was looking something up. David. The headband on David's headphones broke for the second time. He's managed to go through three pairs of headphones in eight years, one pair of Audio-Technica ATH T44s and a two pairs of Klipsch Status. I, didn't, I haven't heard those. I don't know those. He wants a closed back over-the-ear headphones. Cheaper is better. We like them to be more durable. Any suggestions? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hold on. I'm going to click on it right now and see. <laughs> the ones that I have, that I've been using, are the... Uh, Audio Technica ATH M50s. Right. I think they were the S's back in the day for straight people. Okay. But uh, I have had those headphones since Dina was on this podcast. Mm -hmm. I no longer use them. I have given them to a friend who has a 16 year old daughter and a 12, 13 year old son. And he uses them and they all use them. It's sort of the if you're in the home theater and we don't want to hear your. You know, you watching Grey's Anatomy for the fourteenth time in a row, then we make you put on the headphones. They're one hundred and fifty bucks right now. Okay, M fifty Xs are they're just really super durable. I uh, I have no problems recommending those. Now I like to recommend the Sony's, the uh, MDR seventy five oh sixes. Those are the headphones you'll probably find multiple pairs of them in every recording studio in the world. They're like, right. they are the workhorse. Uh, they are super durable. Uh, now, they do have, unfortunately, the coiled wire. That's what they come with. It is yeah, possible like to replace that coiled wire with a straight wire if you really want to. But 80 bucks from Amazon for the MDR 7506s, I think that checks all the boxes. Those are like as durable as headphones are going to get. If you break those, uh, you would have broken anything. So. And 80 bucks yeah. gets you another pair. Yeah. Yours are cheaper than mine. But, yep. you know, whatever. <laughs> so this is a different Justin B, because apparently we got more than one Justin Not Well, Bieber. we always have Justin Not Bieber, so this is a different Justin Not Bieber. Okay. Different, different Justin B. Different. Different. Justin's room is, f what time is it? 14 <laughs> feet wide by 21 feet long by 10 feet high, giving him 3,000 cubic feet to fill. He doesn't want just space. He wants to start at, oh my God, I can't breathe, and then back it down a little bit from there. <laughs> yes. Did you hear the subwoofers we were talking about before? Get one of those. Get Unfortunately, JTR, right? <laughs> JTR. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll knock get, the wind Get the seat and sub submersible. Submersive. Was that one called? The one yeah. that doesn't, is it, doesn't really exist or whatever? There is the seat uh, and I'd get a JTR captivator if you really want to do that. Unfortunately, he's very limited in terms of where he can put uh, the subs and how large they can be. They will have to live in the left and right rear corners and need to have a small footprint. And before we get excited and say, so there's the PC2000 is the shortest cylinder that SVS sells. And those are too tall for the space he has. The SVS SB2000 is about the right footprint. And the L22 from Rhythmic would be about as tall as he could fit. His max budget is $1,000 per sub, so $2,000 total. What would be the solution here? The solution here is to spend $2,000 on one sub. Because if you're putting them both in the rear corners, you're going to end up... I don't, you know, uh, I would get one sub and really, yeah, I don't. Two I don't in the know. rear. I, I mean, it's a, you're going to have to do the trial and error phase thing, which is part I of know. my twelve step process. If Come you uh, look at the thing I'm going to try and copy and paste onto the website, is playing with the phase in trial and error. But I would, I would still go for duels for sure, especially since they have to be small. If and he wants yeah. all the output. So the back of his room must be very short. Why is the back of his room so short? I, it I must don't be know on what's that. going on. It must be like one of these A-frame things where he's at an angle in the base. In a, or he's or bonus built something in that. back there or something. Who knows? He's going to try. Now, let's. He did say the footprint had to be small. I was going to say, if the cylinder is the problem, you can always lay it down, too. Don't, don't forget about that. So. Yeah. But that makes a much bigger uh, footprint all of a sudden. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I said all something about the footprint. I was just wondering, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What you got, Rob? So, I mean, the L22s from Rhythmic wouldn't be a bad choice. Um, those fit the budget. Those are a pair of 12-inch drivers in a sealed design, but you're pretty much going to have to go sealed here. I mean, 
The real answer, if you could afford it, would be something from JL Audio, because that right. gets you the small with crazy output, but then you have to pay through the nose to get it. So What about the E series from them? They do have still small too expensive. ones. Is it really? It really I thought is. they had like the E series were like they're under under a the oh, first one was under a thousand. But that's the eight incher. Oh. Yeah. Oh. What's the twelve? Is it fifteen hundred? It's like fifteen hundred. Yeah. So yeah, I mean JL Audio would be great, but it's expensive. So my top pick for you would be Power Sound Audio. Be one of their sealed models. Would be the S fifteen hundred, which is a thousand dollars exactly for one of them. Right. Now that has the sort of oh, because three thousand cubic feet is on the high end of a medium sized room or the very low end of a large sized room. So output wise, it should be able to handle. Even though it's a sealed one, there's a fifteen inch sealed. The question is, is it small enough? It's about the smallest fifteen incher you can find. It's seventeen by eighteen. So the SB2000 is roughly a 15-inch cube. So this is a couple inches wider and three inches deeper than an SB2000. Right. Will that fit? Because that's not tremendously larger, but it still might be too low. But that, that would kind of be my top choice for you. An S1500 from Power Sound Audio, a pair of those, because that'll actually get you the kind of output that you're hoping for. Yeah, um, it, this is sort of a really weird question. And, and it's, you know, we're not magicians. We can't come up with things that are... Uh, that don't exist. So you're well, asking it's, it's us. It's the pick not, three thing. You want you want small right. and loud and affordable. And I mean, thousand dollars is a healthy budget. And if this was vented, this is no problem. But then it's going right, to be right. much physically bigger. So you want the yeah. small, powerful, and affordable. So we can do small and powerful with JL Audio, but then it's not going to be as affordable. Uh, the Power Sound Audio kind of strikes the best balance, in my opinion. Yeah, if you're really having to go smaller, I would consider going with one JL Audio sub for now, and then yeah getting the second one that's kind of what you'd have date. to do yeah. uh because that that would be that that seems to be i mean if you've seen the inside of those subs they're insane yeah <laughs> I mean, there's so much bracing going yeah. on there's like almost no room for like anything all else magnet <laughs> it, it's just they're just insane subwoofers so i would be it, it, the problem i have here is is that small space so i mean it gives us a really, really hard. Uh, it makes it very, very hard. If he goes to the various subwoofer manufacturers' website, they all post graphs of the frequency responses. But how useful are those for comparison? They all seem to use different scales in their graphs, and they're often showing multiple overlays to demonstrate diff different tuning EQ options. Should you spend this time trying to decipher these graphs, or is a better way to to be able to compare the performance of different brands of subwoofers? Well, the uh, the CEA or whatever it yep. is uh, measurements that everybody's taking these days are standardized. Yeah. It's a very standardized measurement, and Audioholics does it. And what's his name? Uh, database. Yeah. Database. Josh yeah. Ritchie over at Database. Josh Ritchie does it. So you should look for those. Look for C yeah. CEA measurements and then compare those. That being said, uh, in room measurements going to be different. Corner loaded is going to be different. Uh, your room is going to be different slightly. So. But the CEA reality... 2010 is standardized. Uh, one yeah. thing to be aware of, though, is that, so say Database and Audioholics, they list the CEA 2010 measurements as referenced to two meters. That's with the right. microphone two meters away. Whereas you are allowed to list it as one meter away, which in the case of the way CEA 2010 is conducted, if you list it as one meter away, you're essentially adding nine decibels. Right. Not the normal six for the uh, doubling of the distance because it's all ground plane measurements. So you're actually adding nine decibels. So you'll notice over at Power Sound Audio, they list it as reference to one meter away. So right. just subtract nine from those numbers and you have the same numbers that Audioholics or Database would give you. So that's, that is one thing to be aware of, just that it could be referenced to one meter or to two meters. Um, but other than that. It's you unfortunately don't have to worry about any of that because yep. you have too many restrictions on your subwoofer mm. to care what the measurements are. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're, you're, there's gonna be, there's gonna be a handful that, if that, that are even the right size that you can't just look at them and say, yeah, that this one's not gonna work. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of base modules that will fit into your space, but you know that the eight inch driver and the hundred watt amplifier, without looking at any measurements <laughs> whatsoever, isn't gonna cut it. Is is not gonna you know pass muster with that so you know th there's only going to be a couple that even fit in there and then it's going to be it's going to come down to budget and whether or not the, the size works for you so he cringes every time he hears us uh, recommend elite screens especially their motorized screens he bought a fixed frame uh, from them which was missing parts when they arrived and it was a pain getting the necessary parts from their customer service but he's really turned off when he bought an electric screen the screen and its 
black backing were stuck together by excess glue and left back black patches all over the screen the first time we rolled it down. The tab tensioning was, quote, a joke, unquote, in Justin's opinion, and never stayed taut and even managed to get to it even managed to tangle, uh, get tangled in itself. But worst of all, their customer service made him jump through a lot of hoops, asking him to buy and replace parts himself, attempting repairs himself, and then send uh, multiple photos and emails before ultimately, finally, replacing the defective product. This third screen arrived with the screen itself functioning, but the motor was defective, and again, Elite wanted him to attempt to repair some himself. So he's given up on them and is saving up for a Seymour AV instead. Well, that's very unfortunate. It is. Uh, I hate to hear is, that. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I do. I do hate to hear that and uh it's very I mean honestly I mean which one do I have do I have silver tickets you have silver I have silver ticket now I know that Clint over uh at uh I, mean, I don't know what, who he works for now. He has, uh, Clint DeBoer, he has an Elite Screens uh, acoustically, tra- I think he, his might be acoustically transparent mm-hmm. uh, screen in his home theater, and he loves it. He mm-hmm. never, he didn't have any problems with it whatsoever. I asked him about setup and stuff like that. He said that it was, it was easy, it was no problem, he didn't have any issues with it. So, I mean, these things are going to happen. Now, as far as the customer service is concerned, that is very worrying to me, and that's something that we're going to have to re- try to remember when we we talk about them. Because if customer service is an issue and they are doing all this to you, uh, that can be uh, a, a, a cause for concern for people. Now, if they never have a problem with their screens, so they rarely have a problem with their screens, and if they have you know poor customer service, is you know maybe a chance some people want to take. Because this is the first time I've really heard of people having an issue with elite screens, but. That being said, it's still something I'm going to be warning people, uh, warning people about from from this point forward. Yeah, it's it's a little bit tough because I mean we we aren't we've recommended elite screens quite a lot, and we yeah. haven't had a ton of these stories coming back to us. That have that, we had any of these stories? Yeah, this is kind of the first one, uh, especially something say. this bad. And also, yeah. we, uh, I don't actually know where where Justin lives. The, I, I'm wondering if maybe there was a you know, like a difficulty in getting service to him type of situation. I, I'm not saying that's the uh, case, but it's, no, it's no, no, yeah. also and, not... And we're not blaming the victim here. No, too. gosh, Let's no, no, no. Let's just make sure that's, that's, no. that's uh, uh, Yeah, and I mean, it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be pulling hen's teeth to get service. And I've gone through service like that, and it is exceedingly frustrating, and I hate it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Um, you know, the, I, the, I also don't want to just condemn all of Elite Screens and never recommend them again because we've recommended them a lot and haven't had a ton of really horrible stories coming back to us on that front. So... Um, yeah, it's all taken under advisement, you know. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, and, and, and I, I, as sort of a blanket statement, whenever you're dealing with a, a company that is selling a product that is significantly cheaper, a very than discounted else, price, yeah. Uh, I kind of always go into it with the thought that I'm going to have to, if it's something goes wrong, it's going to be a pain to get it right. Sorted. Well, it's out. a little bit like the Vizio thing, right? Like there, there are right. a handful of people who are like, "How can you recommend Vizio? They have nothing but returns and problems." And it's true, there are a lot of returns on Vizios, and there are quite a few customer service nightmare stories from them. And then there's a whole bunch of people who had a really good experience with them too. And it's. Right. Uh, I mean, sometimes it can literally be the individual on the other end of the customer service line, and it's well, not. Well, to, to have him have it with t- two different screens is, you know, yeah. it, it it makes me think it can't be just that one. Well, person. heck, we've but, had people who've had multiple Denons go bad on them, and they're like, "How can you recommend Denon?" Right? So, yeah, it's that it's is tough. True. Very sorry to hear that, though, Justin. I, I hate to hear that. It is taken under advisement. Um, yeah. yeah. That's why with companies like SVS, where I feel like they are selling you a product at a very mm. low price, RBH is the same way. Yeah. Selling you a product at a very low price and they have fantastic customer service yeah. are a rare thing that should be... Uh, That's what makes it so easy modern. to recommend when it exists. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for letting us know. Nick. Nick says the wire cutter made uh, their pick for an affordable 5.1 speaker package and they chose the ELAC debut series speakers. What piqued Nick's interest was that they did a blind listening comparison. However, they also had the strange and very limiting caveat of only considering 5.1 speaker packages with the matching brand of subwoofer. So some brands weren't even considered, and in all cases, the sound being judged included the prepackaged sub. Nick is most interested in getting our take on one particular quote, though. Larger speaker systems almost always won against compact speaker systems, even with their volume, even with their volume levels matched. They are they were, with only a few exceptions, always more dynamic, meaning they could play more quietly without sounding dull and lifeless, and more loudly without sounding strained and distorted. End quote. 
Nick has seen similar comments before, but this time it was made based on blind listening. So what are our thoughts? There's one clarification I want to make right away. Okay, make the clarification before I give my thoughts. Because when they're saying larger speaker systems versus compact speaker systems, they're not talking about bookshelf speaker systems versus tower speaker systems. They're talking about bookshelf speaker systems versus teeny tiny speaker systems. Right, right. All right, because I've seen this comment reflected with, this is why you should always buy towers. They're more dynamic. Right. They sound better. They're fuller, all this type of stuff. That is not what they're talking about at the wire cutter. They were comparing some of these like, you know, like little Bose cubes, that type right. of size. That is what they mean by compact speaker system. And I will agree largely, many of those systems have a hole in the frequency response where the speaker can't play low enough to meet up with the top end of the sub. That's or high point. enough to get to the very high end anyways. They're or high a, enough to get to the very, very high end. They are lacking driver detail solution. in a lot of cases. Yeah. So they, yeah. they're one driver in a box. And yeah, yeah. They, 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 they can't play the highest highs. They can't play the lowest lows within yeah. their range. And then the subwoofer, which is usually substandard to begin with, can't meet them where they need to be met anyway. Yeah, because so. they're talking about the ELAG debut speakers. They're talking about the bookshelf model. And to them, yeah. that is a large speaker. Right. Right. Which to so, many people it would be. Yeah. There's a lot of things. I mean, to, to consider, first of all, whenever I do speaker shootouts, I never have a subwoofer involved. I mean, yeah, unless yeah, the, subwoofer the subwoofer is the shootout. Caveat, that that yeah. really hurts this, in my opinion. Well, and I understand. I don't have a problem with it on on the face of it. Uh, you know, it, these are this is a uh, this is a shootout for people who are going to buy their very first speaker package yeah. and aren't going to consider buying a second subwoofer and want to buy everything all together, and that's. Fine. Yeah, and wire cutter so, heavily favors convenience and price. Like and that's really fine. heavily favors that, and that is fine because they're upfront. That's with that. fine. So it does. Does it hamstring the whole thing? Absolutely. But I don't mm. think it invalidates it. I don't mm. think it invalidates it. And their quote there that that uh, the, the the larger speakers. That's just true. You put a second driver that is handling different frequencies inside of a bigger box. And you compare it to something that's a cube that has a single driver in it trying to do everything full range, you know, from 20 hertz down, down to, let's be generous and say 250 hertz, that the, where the subwoofer is supposed to take over. Yeah, it's not going to do very well. Yeah. It's not going to sound, it's not going to sound very flat. It's not going to have a very, a, a, as full a sound. Of course it's not. So this is just... I mean, this is uh, a Captain Obvious statement is really what this is. I mean, of course, this is true. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the other funny quote that was in there um, was they were saying how it pretty much came down to whichever systems had the best center speaker and subwoofer ended up winning. <laughs> because most of what they're hearing is, is the dialogue out of the in movies and TVs is yeah. coming out of the center. And then if you have a good subwoofer, it fills in the bottom end. I'm like, I could see that being the case yeah. for sure. Yeah. And that's... We've, we've said stuff like that before. And this is a, a very specific use case where people yeah. are just buying their first system. They don't want to have to, uh, they don't want to have to mix and match. They don't understand how all this stuff works. They yeah. just want to be able to plug it in. And a lot of times when somebody, like if, you know, somebody were to email me who was just a friend of mine or something like that and like, hey, I, I found this these two speaker packages online. Right, which one right, do you think right. would be better? I look at them and I see which one has the bigger center channel, which one has the bigger sub, yep. and I say that's the one. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's that's what I would do. Without having looked at this or anything else, I mean, I'm looking at them like, well, this one has this one looks like it's going to be better. I, and, and why? Oh, well, reasons. Because I'm smart. <laughs> And I've done this for no. I mean, you know, their picks. They're like the step down from this was the Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers. Sure. Uh, and then they're like this Elac debut series. They're like that's kind of the middle road that we think would work for the largest number of people. And I I can agree with that. And then they're like a step up pick would be the Kef Q series. And I'm like I can agree with that too. Agree with that too. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah. I don't I don't have any big disagreement with this. I you know. I would choose the subwoofer that's appropriate for the size of room, and I don't care what brand it is, and I would get five other speakers, but I get where they're coming from. Uh, yeah, right. and it's, yeah, the, the clarification that when they say compact, they're talking tiny, not, uh, yeah. not bookshelf versus tower. Steve. Steve lives in Rhode Island, and the Nor'easter went through his area. I think it went through all those areas, but yes, he went through. Power lines went down, and sadly, Steve's a Marantz SR7009 Rust Sound Amp and Dual SVS PB12 NSDs all blue. Yeah. 
Replacing the amp in this rust sound amp got it working again. SVS amazingly said they replaced the blown amps in this dual subs. No cost to Steve, even though it's not totally it's totally not their fault in any way. Stand up service there. Again, we were just talking about that. Replacing a fuse in this Marantz got it making sound again, but there's no HDMI output. It seems the HDMI board got fried. Mm -hmm. Steve has been eyeing a receiver upgrade anyway, so he bought an SR7011. So now the question is what to do with the SR7009. So number one, is there a cheap way to get the HDMI board fixed? Doubtful. <laughs> I mean, there's a way to get the HDMI board fixed. I don't know what you consider cheap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, I can't imagine that it's going to be less than you know, like fifty bucks or something like that. I mean, it's oh no, be... it'll be. You'll have to ship it to their yeah. service center. They, they, I mean, they can. They absolutely can replace an HDMI. Oh yeah, that's board. what they'll they have do to do. The they'll have to replace it. But who knows what else they'll find down the line that's also fried. That's where yeah. you. I think you're going to run into problems here. Uh, if it's making sound, this is another amp. Well, as that's as exactly his next thing. <laughs> so he says, could he, uh, I didn't see that. Could, he could potentially use the SR7009, which is a dumb app for his Atmos channels. How would he connect the SR7011 uh, to the SR7009 to make that happen? Uh, Pre-outs to mm -hmm. pre-ins, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah, because the, the SR7009 has 7.1 analog inputs. You yep. don't even have to do the... So let's say it didn't have 7.1 analog inputs, like a lot of AV receivers don't, sure. and you wanted to run four Atmos channels using your old receiver as just a dumb amplifier. You can usually do that because it'll have, at a minimum, it'll have a pair of left-right inputs, like the CD sure. input. There's two. And then you can usually run zone two as well. It usually you can assign, say, the surround back sure. binding posts to your zone two. So you wire in another left-right input, your DVD input or something like that, left-right audio, and then you send that out of zone two and assign that to, say, your surround back binding posts. And now you have four amplifier channels. But the 7009 makes it even easier. It has a 7.1 analog input. So you can plug in seven speakers if you wanted to and use seven amps. Yeah. Yeah. So I would just do... I mean, basically what you're going to do is you're going to put... Uh, from your outputs on uh, the app, the Atmos speaker outputs mm -hmm. on your 7011, you're going to go to the like the left, right, and surround left, surround right. Doesn't yeah. really matter. Inputs on the SR7009. Yep. You'll put it into pure direct mode. Yep. You'll turn it to reference uh, to, to zero. The master volume on the master volume to zero. Yep. And that's it, Haas. You done. <laughs> that is that is now a dumb amplifier. And that is else. an amplifier. It's going to do nothing other than amplify those channels. You want it in pure direct mode so that it's yeah. not, or direct mode, I guess. It doesn't really matter. Either one. Yeah. Pure. I do pure direct just to be safe. Sure. But and then you go to the settings and you lock everything down. Yep. So and whatever. of course you tune the input of the seven zero zero nine to the seven point one analog input. Of course, because that's where the signal yes. is coming from. Uh, the other thing you would do is uh, you want to make go back into the trim levels. I mean, you don't have to do this because your uh, your seven zero zero your seven seventy eleven will fix this anyways. Mm -hmm. But I would go to trim levels, make sure all the trim levels are at zero. Yeah, just to make just to make sure. And I would. It's uh, one more thing I was thinking about. The distances. Do. Yeah, I, I guess I would change it. Just I mean, usually you can just do those. You can just do a factory reset on the seven zero zero nine. To be honest, just do a factory reset. Factory and leave reset. everything at default. Oh, the other thing I would do is I would go into the menu, and a lot of times you can set the 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 turn on volume. Oh, sure. And you could either do to last or set it to reference. Sometimes you can have it set zero, to yeah. zero. I keep hitting this microphone today. Uh, have, it, have it set to zero so that when it powers off, it powers back on. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, back it'll always come right back at the same volume level. level. Yeah. Yeah. So there All we right. go. Anthony. Anthony's setup is in his basement. It's quite uh, a large open space. He didn't provide the exact dimensions. He sits. He does say that he sits about 13 feet away from his new 65-inch Sony X900E. And if you see these pictures, he is a very good vacuumer. We've got another person with the very clean vacuum lines. Very good vacuumer. I am loving your vacuuming. You could come vacuum my place. Oh, it's yeah. like little Christmas trees everywhere. I love this. All right, so it's a humongous room. It's open to looks like the whole world. And uh, there's like a baby gate that keep things mm -hmm. out, but that doesn't work for sound. It's got a drop <laughs> ceiling Yep. Uh, with can lights in it. It looks like he may have some overhead speakers in it, though that mm. might not be what that is up there. Yeah, I think it's those really are air tell. ducts. I think that's could what those are. Be. Yeah, it could I be. I think those are air ducts. 
So he bought an Xbox One X to go along with this new TV, and now he's feeling like his sound system isn't up to snuff. He has an older Yamaha receiver that doesn't handle 4K, so that needs to be replaced. He's okay with the Klipsch SR, uh, I'm sorry, SW350 Sub, an energy connoisseur center speaker, but his front left to right are leftover Boston acoustic speakers from a compact 5.1 speaker package, again with the small speakers. Mm -hmm. And he tried a pair of DefTech SM45s, but they didn't really seem to fill his space. Things are sounding a little empty. He has maybe a grand he'd like to spend. What we suggest on a new receiver plus whatever speakers he uh, we think he should buy. Uh, do you want to buy have Atmos or are you just looking for right. 4K? Yeah. Because you have a drop ceiling, sir, and uh -huh. it, you if anybody can put Atmos in, it is you. Yes. So yeah. But then can that eats put... up a lot of your thousand dollar budget on an eight hundred dollar receiver. <laughs> right. That's the problem there. So I. Your, the speakers you've been looking at are, first of all, this room is beautiful and well vacuumed and you've got a lot of insulation in your ceiling, but there's nothing else on the walls anywhere. Yeah, it's bare and otherwise, yeah. So you may be having some dialogue intelligibility issues and not feeling your space issues because of how things are bouncing around. Uh, Although at least it is fully carpeted, so that helps. Yeah. That does help. I'm not saying you've got nothing in here, yeah. but it might be. First of all, I know you have a thousand dollars to spend. We're going to ask you to spend more than that, and mm. by the end of this, <laughs> that's just the way this is going to have to go. So sometimes we tell people to spend less money. You, sir, are not that person. So because uh, you've got a lot going on here, and it'd be very easy. So the first thing, you, the first decision you need to make is: Do I want Atmos? Right. If I want Atmos, that's going to make a big difference as to what receiver you're going to buy. Yes. We're going to say. Probably the uh, the Denon X4300H yeah. is what we're going to tell you to buy so that you can get 5.2.4. Well, you could even do 7.2.4 with that one. You'd, you have to add an external two-channel amp to get 11 speakers. So we don't know how do many it. speakers he currently has, though, right? We don't. I mean, it sounds like three from what he said. It sounds like it's a 3.1 setup right now. don't see anything else. So if, if all he really wants is a bigger, you know, a, a 4K receiver. Yeah that can pass through 4K. I mean, he could basically get any sort of entry-level Denon or Marantz at this point. Oh, you sure or Even yeah. Yamaha, if he really wanted to, because uh, yeah. he's already got Yamaha, he could be getting something from them. Yeah, and you, all you the could stuff do passes a, through an, these days. An X1300 or an X1400 would be totally fine. If you're going to stick to 5.1 or 7.1 or maybe go to 5.1.2, then yeah. yeah, like an X1300, X1400 would be fine. Um, the X3300 because it gives you multi-Q XT32 is a nice choice for $500, but you don't have to spend that, and that still tops out at 5.1.2 or 7.1. So, uh, yeah, I I'm thinking like a an X1300, X1400 is probably the appropriate choice. Yeah, and then as far as uh, speakers go, I'm going to go back and uh, say the same thing I said about the other guy mm -hmm. who's sitting way far away, which is Klipsch or the HSUs. Yep. So the HSUs, HB1s, or whatever they're called, yep. uh, those, you know, these are horn loaded speakers that put out a lot of output. I mean, if you wanted to spell, spend more, you can look at like the Philharmonics or whatever those things well, are called. It's way those th more expensive. I know. I just said that. Or if you were, you know, you could be looking at the RBHs too, yep. the new impression series that's out. Their bookshelf speakers would. I mean, both of them are around three hundred dollars a pair. That's that's yeah. the price range. Which, I mean, if you're getting an X thirteen hundred or fourteen hundred, that still leaves you plenty in the budget to upgrade something else, even if you wanted to. Yeah. Maybe get some acoustic panels with that. Yeah. So, but we are you probably should be looking at a center as well. So. Yeah, it would be nice to get all three so that they all match. So yeah. if you got HSU horn loaded three across the front or RBH impression series, uh, three across the front plus plus a uh, Denon. X series receiver, I think you'd be in good shape. Now, if you want, uh, if you, like I said, if you're going to want Atmos eventually, you're mm. suddenly looking at a receiver that's going to eat up most of your budget right yeah. now. So, what I would do is for now, I would connect my uh, X, you know, I would do whatever I did to get the 4K to my to my TV. If mm -hmm. that's going directly to the TV, then audio return channel down to your receiver, which you might not be able to do at all with your Yamaha at this moment. Uh, if that's if that's not if that's if it's such a bottleneck 
then you're going to have to get the receiver first if mm. you are going to end up having Atmos eventually. If not, you get the cheaper receiver. We can yep. You can get the front left and right speakers if you decide to uh, and get a center channel later on if you really want to. Yeah. But you're quickly going to find out that whatever center that you currently had is... It's an energy, right? Is that what you yep. said? Yeah, energy, energy connoisseur, yeah. That, you know, if, if that one's doing okay for you, you can always just try to stick with it and see how it goes. RBH in particular, out of the yeah. models that we've mentioned, is probably going to play the nicest with mm-hmm. it. Agreed. Uh, so you've got some options there. You've got some options. But I would also be looking at room treatments in the future. I would also be looking at uh, overhead speakers and, uh, you know, bigger subs, different subs. Yeah, sub for upgrade subs, maybe. Lots of subs. Yeah. <laughs> we could we could we could hook you up here, but you're going to going to have to open your wallet unfortunately. Do we have time to do one more? Oh, we, we have time sh- to do more more than two more, I think. I uh, we'll see. John S. John has a family of 6 and they are shopping for a new house having a dedicated room for the theater is one of the features they're hoping to find. Don't hope, sir. Make it happen. Make it happen. Uh do not if you walk in the house, I walked in every single house and said, "Where is the theater?" Mm-hmm. And uh, if I didn't see it, I was like, well, you know, it doesn't have a theater. And my wife was like, I know, but what about this? I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't have a theater. Just right. Throwing that out there, it doesn't have a theater. When we walked into this house and it said 4-2 and we found 5-3 and one of them was a like an unlicensed, un- whatever, <laughs> mother-in-law suite that they had built off the back patio, basically, which had been enclosed as well as being part of the house. I was like... Yeah, the five, the one, the five, and the, the extra one that was that not included on the four two that we were looking at. Yeah, that's the home theater. <laughs> so we ended up having to move a wall and do a bunch of stuff. But once I saw the home theater, I was sold. And my wife was sold and everything else, so it worked out. So what would we look for in the home theater room if we were buying a house? Rectangle or easily made to be a rectangle? Attached bathroom. He wants to know what considerations to have in mind. Would having the theater area in one section of a bonus room be a good idea or could a spare bedroom make a good theater okay all those things no well not if i'm looking at a house Mm -hmm. i'm looking for an enclosed theater yes now i I did say bathroom attached it is super nice to have a bathroom attached believe me not 100 percent required if you have to go through a door to get to the bathroom that's not the end of the world well, through another room to get to the bathroom. Right, I mean, yeah. this, you always have to go to the door. You don't have to open well, yes. the bathroom. Door, no, but I mean, right? open the door to your theater. What and kind of people live up in the, Canada? Go no to the entrance da- bathroom, to the bathroom doors. That's not what I meant. That's what it sounded like you meant. All right. Anyhow, uh, an enclosed room. And yes. not square, if possible, and big enough to fit the number of seats that you have. Uh so does does an extra bedroom work? Not usually very well. It can it depends on the size. You're, you're it could. looking at if you're looking at a, 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 a like a traditional small bedroom of ten by eleven or eleven mm, by eleven. Yeah, that's a bit tight. Yeah. Ten by twelve or something like that. That's that's a little too small. Like Do twelve something... by fifteen is kind of a Would... nice size for a small theater. That works. That yep. works. That, that you can get a nice row of seats in there, a big screen, enough speakers, and you got some some room to play with yeah uh you know uh, by definition a bad a bedroom has to have a closet if it doesn't have a closet it's of course not a bedroom it's a, den. Yeah. it's a den or something like that or just a or room. An office uh so you know your closet ends up being your space where you can put your gear, gear. yep so you got to think about where your gear is going to go and everything else and always look to at uh, where the doors are placed in relation to everything else yeah. because a lot of times they're like okay well this can work but, you know, where am I going to put the TV where it's not going to block a door? Where am I going to put the speaker where it's not going to block a door? Where am I going to put the couch where it's not going to block a door? So those are the things to sort of look for. Can you use a spare bedroom? Yes. Mm-hmm. Real small bedrooms don't work in my opinion. But uh, I would also not settle on a section of a room. Yeah, because that's, not, that's just, not the way to That's do just it. asking for problems. I would take a small bonus room. That has sure. a regularly shaped roof and everything else, because all that can be dealt with. Yeah. But I I would do that far before I would take a section of a basement or yeah. a side of a of a. Yeah. Living try room not to have like a that. theater area. Try to have a theater yeah. room. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if it's like a, a rec room in a basement, that'd be fine. A small bonus room, a twelve by fifteen bedroom, all of those can work. But look for an enclosed room where all of the room can be dedicated to being the theater. He says, should he be thinking of two rows of seats? All four of his kids are under 11 right now, but they won't stay that age forever. Uh, yeah, there's no... If, if you find a room that has the, that's the right size, even mm-hmm. if it's 12 by 15... Uh, yeah, I mean, 12 by 15, you could set it up width-wise and just have a wider seat and just right. one row. 
You could. And like I said, on our couch, we can get five people on our couch. Mm -hmm. You know, five normal-sized people on our couch uh, fairly easily. With the kids, we got extra room. And if somebody's sitting on the lap, we got lots of room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a 10-foot wide couch. It's very plush, and, and everybody is very happy. There's only three seats that recline, but once you put them all up and you line them up so that everybody's reclined at the same level, it becomes one big, nicely reclined area. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I also have is like a love seat on the back wall and another individual seat also on the sort of on the back wall it's there's a there's a corner trap that's pushing it off the wall slightly but that has an extra area for people to sit in the back the sound's not optimal they're my kids they can suck it sorry you want to sit in here and you don't want to sit on the big couch with us you can sit at the back of the room where the sound sucks so that's your deal <laughs> so uh that's your second row of seats and i guaranteed your kids aren't going to care not as much as you do so, yeah, I mean, you can, you, you, as far as, that's how my family of five lives. I have no problems believing that your family of six is not going to have. And right now, my 14-year-old, we have to straight up force him to be in here with us. Mm. Like, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, as know, they get into teenage years, they're not going to be all together watching a movie together very you're gonna You're going to be losing them. You know, you're going right. to have to force them to sit in there. And they'll be plenty happy to sit in the back where you can't see them while they're texting yep. on their phone or, you know falling asleep or picking their nails or whatever. <laughs> so lastly, he says, how much does the size of the room make a difference in, in terms of what acoustic treatments would be needed? Well, if you have a really big room, you need more acoustic treatments because you got to cover more area. Yeah, it's all but, it's all uh, just down to the surface area. It's about thirty percent of the surface area yeah. you want you want absorptive. Whether and that includes maybe it's wall to wall carpet or not. So factor that in as well. Although you can always install carpet, right? So Yeah. So, Miguel on Facebook, last question here, because I am really? fading. What, yes, what do we think of Canton speakers, their Chrono series that Accessories for Less sells in particular? I did not think we would get this far. To be honest <laughs> with you. So, why don't you start, and I'm going to look this up. Uh, so, yeah, I've I never heard them, so I really can't give a first-hand opinion. Uh, the Chrono series is not quite their entry level, but it's like towards their... Toward, more closer to their entry level than than their other uh, higher end series. Um, they have seem to be have pretty favorable reviews. Uh, they're a very normal, tried and true design. They're a German speaker company. Aluminum drivers. There's nothing about the design that would throw up any red flags whatsoever for me. They seem to focus on having a fairly nice finish on the outside. So, uh, I mean, there's nothing about them that makes me go, ooh, I, I should avoid that. They, they look like completely reasonable speakers to me. Um, yeah, that, that, that's all I can offer because I haven't heard them. So yeah, this the, Canton in general is something I saw a lot more when I was living in Australia mm. and as I traveled around Europe at times. Uh, this has a very European look about it. Uh, the one thing that concerns me about this speaker, just looking at it, at the so I'm looking at the the Chrono five oh nine point two whatever. Okay. It's a floor standing three way speaker. The tweeter looks low to me. The, tw the tweeter looks low, and I find that that's okay. <laughs> that's that's kind of true on many speakers that are uh, of European design because the couches tend to be a little bit lower, and uh, so ear level is not exactly the same. I have heard some Canton speakers in the past that have been fine. I have mm -hmm. not. There's been nothing that that really super blew me away about them, but they would be, to my mind, uh, similar to a Polk type speaker okay maybe not quite as bass heavy i would say okay but they uh they they seem to be you know sort of a mass market thing which are you know they, i've also seen some of their higher end stuff too mm -hmm. as well but uh i've heard it before but it's been a real long time and nothing super blew me away they're i would say a perfectly respectable speaker company that uh, they, they look I don't completely normal... reasonable to me so they look reasonable they there's nothing on there that 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 screams hey this doesn't make any sense and, right right or yeah. what's going on here and all that i mean they're just they're a speaker so you know <laughs> this is this is one of them that's uh middle I mean, of the road dome. everything yeah. seems to reflect that yeah Middle of the road. I think I can be okay with that. He has one subwoofer for now, but he's planning on getting a second in a few months. Once he has duels, he'd like to use them as speaker stands for his front, left, right speakers. What we recommend putting under his speakers and on top of his subs, isolate the speakers and raise them up to ear level. Well, first of all, I would not recommend that you use them as your front, left, and right speaker stands ah. because that's not the best place for your subwoofers to be. True. We've talked about this multiple times in the past. But to properly place speakers, you need to have them in 
the place that is good for bass, which is not the same place that is good for front, left, and right speakers. So if you absolutely must put them there, right, for whatever reason that it is, uh, first of all, be prepared to not have the benefits of dual subwoofers that you would normally have by placing them correctly, which is more even bass across all of your seats. Mm -hmm. Instead, what you're going to have is something that's probably not that. You're going to have uneven bass and more problems than you would have normally had just by setting them up. So you will then have to go through the process that Rob's going to talk about on yep. our 12-step program for uh, uneven bass in oddly shaped rooms, which will be um, dealing with phase and doing measurements mm -hmm. and uh, basically wasting hours and hours of your life. <laughs> but if you decide to do this anyways, you need something to isolate them in some way from the uh, a, something of layer that absorbs vibrations between the speaker and the subwoofer. Mm -hmm. So what could that be? I've got a couple of, of sound isolation pads. They sell for $200 a piece. You'll need two per speaker. Mouse pads. Mouse, mouse pads. pads work fine. Mouse pads would be fine. Uh, now, if you do need to raise the height, I would suggest put a mouse pad directly on top of the sub or on top of the speaker stand. Sure. Then a block of wood. <laughs> something whatever whatever looks real, nice and gets you the real nice yeah. <laughs> but i mean seriously like anything that has some weight i would like it to have a some kleenex weight box uh, uh some kind of box and then another mouse pad on top of that and then the speaker because i want to have yeah. the the uh, bo both 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 the subwoofer and the speaker have physical vibrations so you want damping in direct contact with the vibrating things and then whatever yeah spans most speaker stands when you it. buy them they have some sort of little rubber pads that that's you right. attach yeah. to the top of the thing and that's the same idea. i mean you could use that uh plumber's tape as well the the rubberized yeah, the, plumber's uh, rubber tape. insulation the uh, rubber insulation tape yeah something squishy that's all yeah, damien's squishy. is such a short answer can we answer i Damon? already scrolled to the top it's I over know. it's rob over. just oh. let it go it's over I, I'm going on vacation tomorrow, uh -huh. and I have to get up at 7.30 a.m. to go run to the office it's to go do some last-minute It's seriously so work. short to answer I this. know. It's weird answer. that we're going to skip it. All right. This is A.V. Rant, the podcast that answers your questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We're going to start with uh, Brock and Brandon, who went to www.avrant.com and left us a PayPal donation. So thank you, Brock, and thank you, Brandon. Yes, Brock, Brandon, thank you very much for those donations. And thank you uh, to our 56 patrons over at patreon.com for uh, signing up for their monthly service to give us a donation every month. So thank you, all of our 56 patrons, including John S. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash Podcast. Thanks so much to our 56 patrons. John, thank you for being one of them. And thank you to Shubu2 on YouTube for telling us about the YouTube not needing to see anymore. Yeah. John, for buying, uh, for letting SVS uh, know that it was because of us that he bought his new sub. And Terry for uh, sending Rob some free uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray discs. Yeah, Shubu2, thank you very much. I never would have checked that, and I'm happy about that. I like it being a simpler address. YouTube.com slash... AV rant. That's it. Woohoo. So simple. Woo. Uh, John S. Congrats on your SVS purchase. Very nice stuff. And Terry, thanks so much for those discs. I appreciate it. For AV rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.